I very much welcome all of you, the students, our uh, colleagues and friends, and above all, our guest speakers, Yves Lomax, Lucy Mercier, uh, Smada Dreyfus, Shumon Bazar, and Hélène Frichot, who came here today to, I hope not for yet another conference, that this, this too, but in order to have a day of celebration of writing and reading. <coughs> reading in public, placing the emphasis on the very act of reading and creating a space of exchange and a space of encounter and to produce a knowledge which can be shared. I would like just to say a few things about the, the, what led us to have that event, and also to say that I'm, I'm extremely uh, delighted to have all these people around the table today, because this is part of a long-term project, a long-term investigation, which has developed over the years in the context of the postgraduate course in history and critical thinking. Uh, we've been working on writing, not only as a means to communicate, but as a means to express, as a form of expression, also as an object of study in itself, in its own terms, And we hope that this event, it's not, won't end today, but will become the start of a sequence of events to unfold in the following years. So we want to see that uh, encounter today, that exchange today, as part of that project. And we want to open today that platform, that discussion, and we very much hope that we'll continue with the speakers and we'll continue with um, the students and the colleagues. Now, going back to the project of writing, eh, I would like to say that writing for us in, in that framework, in that context, has been uh, treated has been uh, uh, explored and has been thought primarily as a project. And this is very important. I know project is a very broad term and it's something I hope that we'll be expanding on and we'll uh, um, analyzing today. But in one way we approach writing in the course, and because the course is part of the AEA, and the AEA is a school of architecture, almost as a design project. That means that we craft the word, we craft the text, we craft the argument. And when I say text, I include the visual and the graphic. So it's not just the written word. So, in this way, writing becomes both a practice of thinking, a way of thinking, and at the same time, a form of expression. And I would like to say that in one, the way of thinking, the practice of thinking, and the form of expression unfold together at the same time. But writing starts with reading. Reading not in order to collect data in order to collect information, but as a tool, a means to cut through the material and disclose multiple and often unthought or unseen aspects of the material, or to disclose the multiple voices. And here I would actually borrow uh, Ellen's word, the transversal cut, uh, because I think um, 
communicates very concisely exactly what I'm trying to say about reading, that is this cut through in order to open up, to challenge uh, the historical evidence, to challenge the multiple interpretations and uses, and to locate oneself, again I'll quote from your abstract, uh, to locate oneself, to position oneself in intimate contact with a situation. And in that way of working, uh, systems of knowledge, technologies of production and distribution of that knowledge, histories, uh, traditions, as well as innovative practices, are re-examined, and the boundaries of what might be regarded as a legitimate object of study are being constantly interrogated, challenged, and expanded. <coughs> so, I will bring in another quote, which uh, again, in my view, captures um, very well uh, what, how, the, how we work, eh? and this is by, uh, the initial words of Walter Benjamin in, his, uh, in one of his essays on language, and I quote, every expression of human mental life can be understood as a kind of language. And this understanding in the manner of a true method everywhere raises new questions. So writing and reading and language in the manner of, the, of a true method, are used to constantly raise new questions. So it's not just a means to communicate, as I said, to, but it's a, it's a method, becomes a method of, informs our method of work. Likewise, every word raises the expectations of meaning, of multiple meanings. It's a signifier, but it's also an agent more inclined toward a more critical model of language that would continue to emphasize aesthetic and theoretical questions. And in the midst of all this, I would introduce, lastly, the element of voice. When we talk about reading, writing, um, challenging, expanding, um, expanding boundaries, uh, interrogating boundaries, how, within that process, how can a credible voice be established? What is a voice? How can we understand the voice? The, the theme of our discussion today is words and voices. Um, as, and I know my students will now <laughs> smile, as Aristotle wrote in the Anima, voice is sound with a meaning. So it's not just a sound, it's a sound with a meaning. So voice is the support of the word, of a, a word, is the support of a discourse. The voice transforms, indeed, the word into an act, a speech act. In this way, it endows the word, the letter, with authority making the word not just a signifier, but an act. It carries meaning, and at the same time, the infinite shades of the voice exceed meaning. So there is a distinction here, I think, between what is communicated through the voice and what is communicated in the voice. So, the voice implies also subjectivity, which expresses itself. And all our social life is mediated by the voice. We use our voices, we listen to voices constantly. It seems that voices are at once the very texture of the social and at the same time the core of subjectivity or the intimate uh, moment of subjectivity. And whereas we inhabit a universe of voices, 
situations like that where reading and writing take over as the medium of our exchange, of our sociability, are much less common. And that's what we want to set today, to create today for all of us. Eve, using her voice, will open up and will experiment. And perhaps um, I just give my reading of your uh, thoughts. Experiment precisely with this. The condition of closeness, as Eve describes, produced through the speaking being. Then Lucy will read and interpret Michel Serre's reading and interpretation of Michel Foucault's seminal work, Madness and Civilization. Then Smadar, through an audiovisual installation, will dislocate and restage a very specific local scene in the space of the lecture hall. And as Smadar describes uh, very eloquently, this is an act of translation on multiple levels. Then Shumon will navigate through the ceaseless circulation of digital images and reflects on the continuous production of a delivery of history itself. And Ellen will conclude our sequence of readings, interpretations, positions, voices, with her own experiment of transversal writing, a precise, the way I understand, a laborious cut through various local scenes, but with no presumption of an ultimate fusion. Eve Lomax is a visual artist and writer. Um, our major publications include Figure Calling, Pure Means, Writing, Photographs and an Interaction of Being, Passionate Being, Language, Singularity and Perseverance, and Writing the Image, an Adventure with Art and Theory. She's also commissioning cop editor for Copy Press, a lovely imprint, and, and uh, director of its Readers' Union. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be back at the AA again. Um, so, nearness, comma, demand. I have to say the comma, it's something that's only read. So each time I'm gonna be laboriously saying comma. Um, let me begin. Number one, speaking out loud. An enunciation of written words forms a spoken performance. And what starts it up, makes it begin, is a surety and a demand. A surety that, I quote, everything in this world is designed to distract us from what is there very close. And a demand to be attentive to nearness. A fire burning, a driving wind, nearness, comma, demand. A written text is spoken out loud and remains present throughout the performance and in many respects can be seen as a score, which almost anyone could read. In a very short text entitled What Voice Brings to a Text, a philosopher is to be found dreaming of philosophical texts being read out loud. Here are texts that comprise ideas and concepts that expand and contract. And a voice has a capacity to trace, to voice the rhythms of these movements. What voice brings to a text is, in an act of reading, the possibility of bringing forth, in the words of Gilles Deleuze, new perceptions and new effects that surround the read and the spoken concept. Now, Gilles Deleuze dreamt of the voice of a particular well-known male French actor reading Spinoza's Ethics a written work and philosopher that he much loved. <clears throat> the voice, and this was a renowned voice of French cinema, would on this occasion be carried by the wind that drives the waves and thought, definitions, demonstrations, and scholia that compose this book. And moreover, the fire that burns within it. And although this event never happened, what I can see in its dreamt of form is the written text called Ethics becoming a score composed of, in the words of Deleuze, waves, but also lines of fire. The enunciating voice would read the score and bring forth what rises within its composition, which is, as Deleuze says, all the perceptions through which Spinoza lets us grasp the world. 
And he also says with a hint of reverie, it may be the most beautiful contribution to a theatre of reading. What voice brings to a text is the possibility of making new effects arise around the read word, the spoken word, the spoken idea, or the spoken concept. And there's something else that is made heard with these words read out loud. It is nothing other than speaking being. Two, as speaking being. Speaking being, two words are held tight together. And what is affirmed is an inseparability between speaking and being. A spoken performance testifies, celebrates speaking being. But let's make no mistake about it. Speaking being doesn't refer to a being who happens to be speaking about this or that, but rather being speaking. What voice brings to a text expresses of a text and gives utterance to is being in the mode of speaking. And what truly is to be heard is being as language. As, being as, in this case, being as language. And the demand is to grasp this as utterly, which is to say, to take as is not referring back to something that comes before it. Being as, and absolutely so, brings what I can only call an exposure. Me, or whatever, exposed simply as, and no bullshitting. And, in this case, being as language. And call me a singularity. And in this case, no division is cut that produces the linguistic and the non-linguistic. And what's more, nothing of yourself is left behind in some separate realm, which is to say, you are your utmost self. And being that, the being that I am, which is never a possession of mine, remains utterly close to itself. Nothing is detached from it in its taking place. Here it is, with as, there comes an immeasurable nearness, and there is demand for it to be thought and experienced. Three, the insertion of a comma. Unbridled nearness was indeed what I felt when, a couple of years ago, a comma was inserted to form the title for an event on International Women's Day, celebrating the publication of a book originally written in Austria. Now, an intuition had me putting a comma between two words and forming the simplest of syntagms. Translation, comma, friendship. Now, immediately I could see the comma is unlike the conjunction and, which separates as it conjoins. I could also see that it doesn't secretly take over the place and the work of the copula, is, that arranges sentences according to, first, a subject, and second, what is said about it. What the comma does is to bring these two words, call them nouns or terms, and indeed the matter of each, near to each other, close and even closer. Translation, comma, friendship. For sure, upon first reading these words, it appears that the insertion of the comma, one word is simply following another. But read the words again and yet again, and things begin to lose fixity. What follows, friendship, could just as well come before. The comma, far from settling a sequence, empowers what comes first and what comes after to freely circulate. Losing fixity and distinct position, the one and the other begin to fall together and to be found amid each other. And, as far as I can see it, what has to be apprehended is a nearness far more reaching than any spatial idea of it. So an intuition had me inserting a comma. Yet something was coming to me. It was a calling for an aptitude akin to clairvoyance, to become a seer. I see it now, but not then. The clairvoyance asked of me is to see that the comma, friendship, translation, translation, friendship, is the taking place of a demand for an inner swear, for an evening, and much longer, the one and the other are found in the middle of each other. Four, characteristics of demand. Nothing detached or separated from itself in taking place as. A comma empowered, powering an excessive nearness. 
the likes of which finds things in the middle of each other and a demand. A wind, a fire. Um, with that said, of course, I want to ask, what is it that demands so? Answer, in the first place, it is demand itself. Demand. What does a demand demand? Straight away, I need to understand that a demand is not a command. Command. Nor is it the duty of an obligation, nor the must of an imperative. Demand. Giorgio Agamben alerted me to it, and he himself drawing on the philosophical work of Leibniz. I quote, We say that something demands something else if the first thing is, and the second will also be. But the former does not logically imply the latter, nor force it to exist. What a demand demands is, in fact, not the reality, but the possibility of something. The possibility that becomes the object of a demand is, however, stronger than the reality. So what matters with a demand is possibility. Better still, what matters is a possibility that contains a demand. And this is not only possibility demanding to become a reality, but also, and significantly so, something, being, whatever, demanding its possibility, its potential. And what is to be acknowledged here is that both existence and possibility, subject and object, are invested with demand. And it's a process that at once affects and implicates both the subject and the object of a demand. Hence, demand is found in the middle. Demand is in the middle of both. And we can call this a medial process, a medial process. And this process, and this is key, troubles any attribution of the demanding verb to a subject that is outside and unaffected by the process and which governs it as a sovereign agent. The subject is also subject to a demand. And what demand is doing here is unsettling the fixing and the presumption of the pre-existent. I can't say what comes first, and I can't say what comes second. And this changes everything. Demand becomes a threshold where existence and possibility lose fixity, come in contact with each other, fall together, touch each other, are found amid each other, closer and even closer. A demand is not a command nor is it the duty of an obligation or the must of an imperative. It is rather a medial process that brings to the world a nearness irreducible to any spatial idea of it. Being neighbours doesn't always make us close. Five, being mode. Now, it was some time ago that my attention was beckoned by as, and years later I'll find myself reading Giorgio Agamben writing the proper place of mode is in this as. Now maybe, I really don't know, you're accustomed to thinking of mode, modality, as the disposition, a form, modification or way of being taken by something already there. The how of a what, that in its being remains above or below and in, in, indefinitely before whatever mode, right? Now things are quite different, however, when not distracted, we stay close to mode being as. Then we can see and experience being taking place without anything separated or detached from it. I see it now, but not then. As is the threshold of a demand. It does change everything. Here it is. Between being and mode, there is a demand. It is in the, mi in the middle of both. Being is a demand of mode, just as mode is a demand of being. Being and mode are found in the middle of each other. Between being and mode, the relationship is neither that of identity nor difference. For with demand in the middle, mode is at once identical and different. So with the two terms falling together, akin to existence and possibility, identity and difference are transformed by de demand and found in the middle of each other. And with this mediality, there is no subject, no substance, no essence, no identity, no self, no being, no whatever that can be taken as coming first and always already there, pre-existent and in power. The architecture of the world changes. 
Or perhaps it's more a case of a burning house where a fundamental arch architectural problem becomes visible, perhaps, for the first time. A driving wind, a burning fire, nearness, comma, a demand. Six, mediality, middle voice. In George Aragambin's Use of Bodies, a work of words and philosophy that has been read and read and indeed bled into these words, you'll find the suggestion that demand is originary, a power with which being and mode, identity and difference, are found only amid each other and falling together. Now, is power the best name? This much I can say, demand has no recourse to a subject outside the process which governs it as an agent or chief. Indeed, <clears throat> the medial process of demand flies in the face of a power that constitutes itself by separating something from it that it will henceforth control. And I have to go and just get my water, which I forgot to bring with me. Right, so the concept, nature of demand, that's been brought to my attention is very much akin to a verb form called the middle voice, and we don't have it in English. It's found in Latin, and for example, the Greek Christi, forgive me if anybody speaks Greek, because um, I don't pronounce it very well, and Christi means to make use of, to use. And with the verb Christi, you don't find a subject that uses an object, but rather a subject that is constituted only through the using, which is to say that the subject is only found in the middle of the process, and consequently, the subject who makes use and the object used are inseparable. And this idea of use has implications for obviously instrumental use and utilitarian use. In many respects, you could say they are rendered as not. Seven, sayability. And then someone is saying, Agamben, it's him again, and why not, is saying in the use of bodies, is saying the thing, the world, demands its sayability. Sayability. <clears throat> now, sayability exists in everything you and I utter. We are, dis we are disclosing it with every word appearing on a page, every voice giving forth loudly, or whispering in your ear. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is here now with the words I read out loud. And in a sense, a spoken performance is a testimony to it. <clears throat> now, simply put, sayability, as the word itself suggests, is an ability. <clears throat> Language can say, and can is the power of a capacity, the power of potentiality. Language can say. So sayability is not what histories or laws or codes of conduct, conduct or social formations p permit me or you to say. Rather, it expresses the modification undergone by the being of the world in becoming as language. The Stoics called it lepton. The world can be in the mode that is language. The world can be as language. And as is the threshold of a demand, the world demands its sayability. And what there is to grasp, hold tight and hold dear, is that demand plays on both sides. The world demands its sayability, which is to say that both the world and language are invested with demand. So through its medial nature, demand, the demand of sayability, brings about an unbridled nearness of language and world. In fact, the, the demand is for, and to use Agamben's words for yet one more time, the word not to distance us from things, for, but to keep them close and even closer the word not to distance us from things, but keep them close and even closer. But this nearness, that's to say sayability, that's to say the demand that plays on both sides and put words and things in contact 
and in the logical sense, Deleuze calls it an event. It's not a matter of language saying something about something. That's to say language signifying, denoting, and presupposing. Indeed, with the nearness of language to world, there comes no presupposing of a non-linguistic realm that comes before language. With language and world, word and thing being a mode, existence and possibility found in the middle of each other, I can hardly speak of sides. It truly is taking thing, the taking place of things without anything separated from them and apprehending things from the inside, grasping them by the middle. Eight, a design to distract us. Me, you, the world, things, whatever, being as the mode of language is where, but yet not exclusively, an immeasurable nearness is to be experienced, even if everything in this world is designed to distract us from us. A fire, a driving wind, demand, nearness. And what I'm holding dear is that demand, the demand for nearness, the demand for the word not to distance us from things, but to keep them close and even closer, has no recourse to a subject, power or cause or higher being that is external to the process. No one's giving orders, no command, duty or imperative. On the contrary, it is like being touched, likely to be given something in your hand that you know in your heart so much can turn upon. Pivotal, say political, yet that could be to say too much. But this much I can say, experiencing the nearness of world and language is not an experience of a world stuffed full of some things and separate and yet tacked onto them the some things that are said about them, such as the grass is green. That is language saying something about something. The apple is red. And that is the sentence with its subject and its predicate. And that sentence can have us forgetting or abandoning. A gamble will go as far as to say betraying a demand for the closeness between world and language, word and thing. You could say there is something in the very construction, let's say architecture, of that sentence that distracts us from apprehending and coming close to sayability. That's to say, the modification undergone of the world in becoming as language. Yet even with a sentence that accommodates, houses something, something being said, the fire of demand, nearness burns. And if we stick around to watch this become an internal conflagration, we can see amid the flames, in that sentence with its subject and predicate, it has separation at its foundation. That is the fundamental architecture problem that becomes visible in the burning house. Nine. I have ten points, <laughs> just in case you're getting anxious. The nominal syntagm. Now, perhaps we are oblivious to the demand for the world to keep us close and even closer to things. When we say the grass is green and introduce or simply let be a separation and hence distance, distance between a subject and what is said about it. Now, there are situations in language, with language and so many different languages, where something called subject and something said about it fall together and leave no space to be filled by a linking copula that says is or requires the insertion of a verb for the completion of what we call predication, saying something. This falling together this absence, yet no lack of copula or verb, is what linguistics call the nominal sentence, or the nominal syntagm. It's Snow White and Jesus Messiah. It's an inseparability that, however, does not form a proper name. It is best the water. It is sun, morning, sparkle, dust. Now, in his Problems of General Linguistics, published in the 1970s, the wonderful Emile Benveniste writes of the nominal sentence. And he says it's a highly peculiar syntactical form, yet it is widespread and it is utterly distinct from the verbal sentence. And what is characteristic of it is that it places the utterance beyond the subjectivity of the speaker. And what's more, the nominal sentence or syntagm expresses modality. That's to say, being, 
being its mode. For example, the mode of warm being sun, or the mode of green being grass, or indeed world, including me and you, being language. The nominal sentence is, to quote Benveniste quoting, a state and the modalities of that state. So it's Snow White and Jesus Messiah. The state is not to be presupposed. It does not pre-exist. Rather, we find things as, and utterly so. And that's to say we find things as indivisible events. As is nothing like as if, which is where the bullshitting really begins. As if architecture, as if the shelter, as if writing fiction. Art needs to get rid of as if. With the nominal sentence, we are amid as, and I truly have the chance of experiencing sayability from the inside. The nominal sentence expresses modality and a world of indivisible events. The subject and the predicate are simply as not. And what's more, you can't say what comes first and you can't say what follows after. Dust, sparkle, morning, sun. And there is nothing whatsoever in the design of this nominal syntagm to distract us from getting close to and feeling the touch of, lightly to be given something in your hand, the nearness of word and world that is the demand of sayability. So the nominal sentence gives us the chance not to forget or betray sayability, and better yet, lets me enjoy as being language. The sun's being warm as language, and with it, the joy that nothing is left separated in some non-linguistic realm. The non-linguistic realm is only a presupposition of language. A fire burning, a driving wind, nearness comma demand. 10. Nothing given to distract us. Now, today within this room, this building, there is demand, and the assertion of a comma will show it. Here it is, architecture, comma, writing. It goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. This demand is irreducible to writing something about architecture, saying something about something. This building is tall and has sash windows on two floors. Architecture, comma, writing. I can say this now. With the insertion of that comma, a nominal syntagm is formed. There is no separation to a subject and a predicate, no foundation built upon separation, and with a demand for nearness in the middle, a messing with attribution, there is no prior agent, no subject, no chief, no master builder giving orders or saying you must. The comma brings closeness. They're nearby to each other, but, let's, but it's much more than being next door to one another. It's about being in tune, an experience of congenuity. Indeed, with possibly and, uh, possibility and existence, losing fixity and falling together, smack in the middle, architecture, comma, writing, become each other's possibility. And furthermore, and this is the crucial bit, with these possibilities and existences both infested, invested with the fire and the wind of demand of nearness, there is in the middle of writing, in the middle of architecture, nothing stopping you being touched lightly and given something in your hand that you know in your heart so much can turn upon. At that moment, hold it tight, nothing is given to distract us from ourselves. At last, I'm not distracted. Um, Lucie Mercier, looking at the field of tension between philosophy, race and postcoloniality. She is specialized in the philosophy of translation, postcolonial theory, 1960s French structuralis stru sorry, structuralism and epistemology, and also German critical theory. That's a lot. Um, she has published in Theory, Culture and Society, in the Palgrave Encyclopedia of Imperialism and Anti-Imperialism, and she's an editor of Radical Philosophy. Now, and I think all of those are now online. We tried to source copies for today, but they're all available on open source online. It's so print on demand. Print on demand as well, okay. So okay. thanks for being here today. Well, thank you so much to Caroline uh, and to Marina for organizing this day. I'm very happy to be here with you um, in an unfamiliar setting. Can you hear me? I don't know where I should stand, here? Um, 
So for this intervention, I have prepared a commentary. And since we were asked to place uh, words, voice, and reading at the center, I've chosen uh, rather long uh, quotations um, to uh, illustrate uh, the text I'm talking about. So I've put the parts of the text I'm reading uh, on this PowerPoint, but of course, if you prefer just listening, uh, that's even better. The PowerPoint is only there uh, in case my reading is not clear enough. So I'd like to draw today on something that's not commonly associated with the idea of voicing, of giving a voice, that is formalization. I propose to go back to the 1960s as a period during which an outburst of experimentation took place within French philosophy, especially with regards to developing transversality across disciplinary languages and across philosophy and science. Whilst structuralism has long been evoked as a transitory phase and failure overall in the history of French thought, there has been in recent years a resurgence of interest in the stakes of structuralism as a complex philosophical movement. With temporal distance, it has become clear that while structuralism constituted neither a school nor a method, it has given rise to a profound renewal of French philosophy, the implication of which we are still reckoning with. So, um, so what I'm going to present today is, a, is largely a work in progress. Um, uh, so a, a, an aspect or a part of uh, this uh, uh, rereading of the 1960s moment uh, in French philosophy. The translatability of an experience is never guaranteed. An experience cannot be coded and decoded following a rational rule or even an algorithmic procedure. How are we to grasp experiences that do not speak for themselves or in their own name, or that exceed the bounds of normal communicability? On this very paradox, Michel Serre opened his 1964 Geometry of the Incommunicable Madness, not, which is no other than his review of Michel Foucault's Madness in Civilization, which had been published a few years before, in 1961. In order to discuss madness, one has to find a language. This decision envelops all the other problems. One can speak about unreason or let unreason itself speak. In the first case, one uses the idioms of rejection and covering up, as if one were talking about a foreign land, a voyage to Erewhon, an animal with bizarre habits, a dangerous thought, or a naturalized object. The object thus finds itself imprisoned behind a facade of a linguistic perspective where truth is at the center in the mouth of the speaking subject. It is he who is understood and not that of which he speaks. The reasonable one is understood, the one who describes the madman according to his own norms. The madman is rejected, excluded from the very norms of language of which he is the object. On the other hand, it is possible to borrow the autochthonous language of the object in question. He who listens must then turn to the necessary translations and decipherings. This presupposes their possibility, the possibility that every human language has ciphers that transpose it into another language, which is general, generally true. But at the limit, the cipher seems to vanish if the language spoken exists outside of the rules of this rational game that makes translations possible. No one could understand someone who speaks to the birds if he really expressed himself in their own song. The chosen idiom thus comes as close as it can to expressing its subject, but when it comes to delir delir delirium, may seem to have no more sense than nonsense. Ultimately, the madman speaks of himself, but he cries his madness in a desert. In the early 1960s, the French intellectual scene was, as you know, swarming with new and often wild formalisms. 
After Levi-Strauss's application of the principles of phonology to the study of kinship, he moved to the use of mathematical, the mathematical notion of structure of transformation in order to read indigenous American myth. Meanwhile, Jacques Lacan was also experimenting with mathematical formalization. Roland Barthes, Gilles Deleuze, Jacques Derrida all drew on both the potentialities and limits of structuralism as a new and promising form of formalism. In the 1960s, the wager was probably that of finding a good formalism, one that wouldn't fall into the pitfalls of metaphysical thinking, whereby form and matter, abstract and concrete, remain ontologically disjoined. Instead, uh, the idea was to rethink the relation of abstract and concrete, formal and historical. The point was to try and translate or reconstruct through structure of differential relations the object under analysis. It is fair to say that Michel Foucault had from the start an oblique relationship to the movement called structuralism. He always contested this label for himself while at the same time being profoundly marked by the general transformation in knowledge that it had provoked. The text that I propose for today brings to light something that's not generally recognized as a formalism, but that perhaps functions as one in Foucault's early writings, that is, spatiality itself, a spatiality considered abstractly. The young Michel Serre, who wrote this review at age 33 or 34, was then immersed in the philosophy of mathematics and was especially interested in topology and its history, in particular in its prehistory or anticipation in Leibniz's so-called analysis situs. Serre's strategy in reading this text is to read Foucault's history of madness through the lens of such an abstract spatiality against what he calls the covering up, recouvrement, of the experience of, mind, of madness by the naturalizing discourse of medicine or psychology, against overwriting its language, Foucault's insight for Serre is to solve this dilemma by means of a third language, that is geometry. This is one of the secrets of its writing. Foucault has chosen to write this book in the language of geometry. Geometry understood in what we might call its earliest form, at the precise moment when it's still aesthetic and already formalized, when its form of expression is still concrete but already highly rigorous, when its density is presented in a conceptual quasi-emptiness. In fact, if we consider the terms and vocabulary, the style, the logic, the organon of the work, we will see clearly that they are drawn from a meditation on the primary qualities of space, on the immediate phenomena of situation. If we analyze its contents, reading attentively, attentively for repeated vocabulary, we will notice the weight of words like space, emptiness, limit, situation, division, separation, closure. Closure and segregation are actual experiences, historical laws resulting in an excommunication that soon proscribes all exchange or dialogue. Consequently, the form of language used here very quickly approaches an explication of the silence of the mad. The spatial style that expresses the fundamental experience of quarantine becomes the style of the conditions of possibility of this silence. The exclusion of all language is here recounted in the language of an abstract theory of pure exclusion. Through this spatial language, Foucault transcribes what is most central to the experience of madness, that is, exclusion. First ill-defined and chaotic, the excluded realm takes a more and more definite shape with the successive technologies of internment. <coughs> In the Renaissance, the madman could always be a neighbor. The frontiers of madness remained fluid and ubiquitous. In the classical age, this frontier suddenly hardened, I quote, for the complexity of this infinite system of proximities and recognitions will be substituted the gross division of space into two terms, end of quote. 
Foucault, Ser explains, positions himself as the very locus of this division, on the ridge line of this limit, observing the two spaces thus constituted between reason and unreason. He is thus able to rewrite the history of madness as a history of exclusion itself. Only what we called the pure theory of exclusion can define madness, define or discriminate or delimit an essence, nature or situation, writes Sir. Foucault develops, I quote, a formal rigorous organon of the purely qualitative, end of quote. For Ser, this pure form encapsulates better than any language the historical experience of madness as it figures the regime of exclusion and its permanent binary making in its historical, symbolic, and cultural complexity at once. What we obtain is not a specific cartography of the spatial disciplining of madness, but the structure of exclusion itself. Ser shows that the object that Foucault gave himself is therefore both historically situated and yet transcendental, insofar as it retrieves, I quote, the structural genesis of every possible alienation. It contains all the formal models of the treatment of the other. So sometimes the negative is very precisely an image, a representation, part of an elsewhere or another world, transporting here an unknown presence. Sometimes it is what is rejected, what surely I am not, an other, absolutely a stranger, and someone with whom I have no relation. Thus even the relation of alterity is excluded, the other is isolated, foreclosed in his insula insularity, or else he is the morally bad, the sinner of the scriptures, sometimes is the asocial or unintelligible, he who speaks a language that has nothing human left to it, ultimately the one whose work runs between his hands without his being able to stop and accomplish it. It is thus very much a question of the system of all possible variations of the negative, and this structural variation of the negation constitutes history itself, the odyssey of alienation. Ser, after this rather praising analysis of Foucault's method, after having shown that the most incommu incommu uh, incommunicable language could in fact be translated and as it were decoded through geometry or topology, Ser reaches a fundamental obstacle. In fact, by writing the history of these confinements and exclusion, Foucault paradoxically registers the very impossibility of confining madness within a definition. I quote, this type of definition reveals more on reason or society which isolates to recognize than on the madness that is isolated, end of quote. This topology draws a precise image, not of madness, but of reason itself. If Foucault's book lets unreason speak, it is only insofar as it reflexively constitutes the discourse of reason on unreason. Ascribing a space to unreason and observing the successive transformations of this space, what Foucault constructs is a powerful mirror of the Western cultural world and its rationality. So two notions of translat translatability are thus pitted against one another. The first comes from Serre's optimistic formalism. There is always a way to transcribe the experience of madness, to find its autochthonous language, and this way is geometry, space, topology. However, any attempt to grasp madness, to tra translate it into a language, necessarily stumbles on an obstacle that no translation can overcome, the specular character of unreason. Trying to circumscribe the experience of madness might in fact not reveal us anything other than our own system of exclusions. It is only constituted as an object of knowledge insofar um, as it is an ensemble of structural negation of rational subjectivity. This review circulated widely in the philosophical circles of the time. For instance, it was regarding, regarded by Louis Althusser as, I quote, the first attempt to read the book as a structuralist text. 
in the precise sense of mathematical structuralism. Whereas Gilles Deleuze, in his short volume on Foucault, would return to Foucault's early writings through the lens of a discursive pragmatism and a diagrammatic, Serre, in this 1964 review, unfolds Foucault's argument in purely formal terms. His wager is that the more formal the analysis, the more encompassing of historical content. He retrieves a sort of purely transcendental scheme of intelligibility of the problem at hand. In other words, he shows that Foucault's history of madness contains a general theory of exclusion as such. He explains the book not by disclosing Foucault's own structuration of his archival material, but by focusing on something like its spatial unconscious. What is interesting with Serre's claim here is that, on the one hand, it is an exaggeration. The history of madness unfolds in time a number of fundamental transformations, inversions, ruptures in the representations, and in the management of insanity in Western Europe from the end of the Middle Ages until the 19th century. Reading this history topologically reduces it to a number of operations. At the same time, by following his own structuralist and topological line, Serre pushes Foucault in a direction that Foucault would in fact continually explore in subsequent years, that is, the relationship between knowledge and power. Serre anticipates here, in 1964, the crucial role that spatiality plays in our grasping of the multidimensional effects of power. Such spatiality has has to be abstract in order to play this critical role of vanishing mediator between power and knowledge. It has to produce the difficult, perhaps impossible hyphen between formalism and history. I have now returned on much more familiar grounds, that is, the nexus of power and knowledge, on which so much has been written since. However, I suggest um, that this dialogue between Serre and Foucault may serve to shed light on the vexed problematic of space in Foucault, the geography of his theory, a problem that has only grown in importance with the translation of his works in many languages and the globalization of their scope to the non-Western, post-colonial and neo-colonial context. Spatiality is everywhere in Foucault's writings, but his geography is always meant to be imprecise, as though this lack of specificity was the condition of possibility of his bold hypothesis. In a 1976 interview on geography, titled Questions on Geography, Foucault was interrogated by a geographer about the profusion of spatial metaphors in his writings. Clearly annoyed by the turn taken by the interview, Foucault answered rather bluntly. Well, let's take a look at these geographical metaphors. Territory is no doubt a geographical notion, but it's first of all a juridical political one, the area controlled by a certain kind of power. Field is an economical juridical notion. Displacement, what displaces itself, is an army, a squadron, a population. Domain is a juridical political notion. Soil is a historical geological notion. Region is a fiscal, administrative, military notion. Horizon is a pictorial, but also a strategic notion. So he starts by showing that if there are metaphors, so let us remember that a metaphor comes from the Greek metaphorain, uh, which meant a transfer or a translation. Uh, so if he starts by showing that um, uh, if there are metaphors, these metaphors are not purely poetic or rhetorical. They are in fact regulated. They clearly pass from one disciplinary domain to another and carry these meanings with them in their transport. Here Foucault draws on what the French epistemological tradition, including especially Gaston Bachelard and Georges Canguillem, had worked on at a lot, that is the transdisciplinary workings of scientific concepts. He continues in this way. 
people, people have often reproached me for these special obsessions, which have indeed been obsessions for me. But I think through them, I, didn't, I did come to what I had basically been looking for, the relations that there can be between power and knowledge. Once knowledge can be analyzed in terms of region, domain, implantation, displacement, transposition, one is able to capture the process by which knowledge functions as a form of power and disseminates the effects of power. There is an administration of knowledge, a politics of knowledge, relations of power which pass via knowledge and which, if one tries to transcribe them, lead one to consider forms of domination designated by such notions as field, region, and territory. Um, and the political strategic term is an indication of how the military and the administration actually come to inscribe themselves both on a material soil and within forms of discourse. Metaphorizing the transformation of discourse in a vocabulary of time necessarily leads to the utilization of the model of individual consciousness with its intrinsic temporality. Endeavoring, on the other hand, to decipher discourse through the use of spatial, strategic metaphors enables one to grasp precisely the points at which discourses are transformed in, through, and on the basis of relations of power. These metaphors are, at the same time, it seems, metaphors for strategy, in the military sense, and strategic metaphors, in a sense that they reveal the points at which discourses are transformed by relation of power. What I find especially interesting in Sell's reading of Foucault is the way in which, through unearthing his spatial logic, he anticipates the famous thesis of the productivity of power, which Foucault only developed in the early 1970s. Philosophically, this raises questions about the equivocal nature of Foucault's spatial language or spatial writing, which must retain its purity and hence its absolute generalizability, as in uh, geometry, while at the same time carrying the weight of history, as it were. The big return of these operations in critical geography, through notions of bordering in neighbors, frontiers, etc., nowadays, manifests, I believe, the relevance of trying to grasp what happened around formalization in the 1960s, where uh, the, linguistic, the linguistic and the spatial, the aesthetic and the metaphorical crisscrossed and switched roles. Grasping the power of such an equivocity, we may even claim, is cardinal not only on the side of discourse and theory anymore, but also, as for example, the analysis of scholars, scholars such as uh, I.L. Weissman have shown in trying to grasp the mutual entanglements of philosophical thought and global military warfare, where spatial metaphorics are re-territorialized. Re Thank you. It's to Jesus. I love the fact that I'm the only male in this whole session. Uh, but you only quoted male philosophers. Could you speak about that in terms of voice? Well, actually, I talked about that during my conference, which was on the geopolitics of philosophy. So I've not worked so much on, on feminism or feminist philosophy, but I've worked quite a lot on how to rethink the death problematic of decentering philosophy uh, in light of post-colonial critique and things like that, so it has a lot to do with voice. Um, I believe, um, I don't believe in um, a direct politics of quotation in the sense that I don't, um, um, I'm not trying to um, The kind of transformation of philosophy I'm looking for is not um, a kind of um, token uh, introduction of names within uh, whatever I do. So here it was uh, very, uh, very close um, uh, diving into a 1960s problematic where um, 
uh, here um, female names didn't come to my mind. But um, I think that we have to work uh, through these questions, especially in regards with feminis feminism, uh, female voices, uh, um, within philosophy and post-colonial uh, and, 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 and that issue of race. Uh, I think we have to work on this from within um, the questions that we raise. Uh, and so it, it's not about including the problem, it's not about including all these voices in every problematic, but per perhaps in choosing the problematics that guide us to these uh, other voices. But just to follow that up, though, the, I mean, you know, obviously de decolonization is one of your topics, but we're at a point now in, in terms of the history of the, of the academy about decolonizing, like, the discourse of the academy, right? Like, as well, um, and particularly in, you know, sort of Western, in the sort of Western canon. And so surely one of the ways in which one needs to be doing that, in a way, is, is actually be quite like quite transparent about the way in which we're we're continuing and sustaining you know like hegem like he like hegemonic structures of referencing um, and of it's okay and of um, you know and in a sense the continuing the you know yeah the, the continuing transmission of 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 uh, in a way, the, 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 the way in which the, the academy has been colonized by these, you know, by precisely the repetition of these, like, hegemonic structures. So, I mean, I'm not saying, it, it, my question wasn't, it's not accusatory, because there, you could also, you know, you could have just said, yeah, it's the 1960s, I'm looking at a sort of a network of philosophers, and there weren't any, you know, active female ones there. And then, you know, maybe there's a feminine, you know, like, someone who's doing their PhD in the feminism of this period who could say, well, maybe there was, and then we could have another sort of discussion. But I was just, I was just curious whether, in your work on decolonization, whether you, there's a reflexive moment in your work in terms of decolonizing of the, you know, the, the discipline of philosophy, and Western or French philosophy itself as well. Of course, but, but I, I, I firmly believe that we shouldn't discipline ourselves and police those uh, quotations and those dropping of names. And so I have worked on, you know, I've, I've worked quite a lot on Franz Fanon, for example, or, and, and my colleagues work on, on, on a lot on, on feminist philosophy and really trying to bring the two together. Um, uh, but it's extremely difficult. Uh, also, we are uh, constrained by the history of philosophy. So we're not uh, like, we're not uh, working on this kind of flat plane of theory where we bring uh, theories together and, and I, as, as if all these voices were uh, somewhat on the same plane. It's, it's, what is really difficult is that we, we constantly have this complex relationship to the, lineage, uh, to the historical lineage and, and transmission of a, of a philosophical tradition. And, and if we lose that, it's really hard to, to speak from within a philosophy. So maybe we do something else, and maybe that's the destiny of all of this. Maybe, you know, Foucault and Deleuze and all these people have been taken up uh, so much uh, beyond this uh, and, and dissolved, in a way, as it were. The can so, yeah. yeah. It's if, I, if I may add something as well there, because uh, looking at the 60s, and I'm, I've been looking at 1968 for Paris Visiting School, desperately trying to find, like, female philosophers. And I think it's in 67, um, well, I think Kristeva was on the scene, but um, there was um, Lucie Ligaret and Hélène Sissou had just submitted their thesis, so I think it was just the beginning then. Maybe Hélène will talk to us about it. But, um, yeah, but it was very difficult. Making conscious choice just ended up being one of those things where you're desperately looking for things and not, you know, um, not necessarily finding it. Maybe more um, writers, actually, Elsa Triolet, and yeah, there were, but philosophy was, stiff, yeah, really hard to find. <laughs> yeah, so we can discuss that perhaps later on, and um, I'm gonna introduce Madar. 
um, for a more, as I said, immersive experience. Um, so Smadar Dreyfus was born in Tel Aviv and has been based in London since 1990. Examining a social-political context and how it reverberates in everyday life, Dreyfus's practice investigates the role of the voice in the constitution of contested public spaces, its function as a mediator between the individual and the collective. Re-listening to the place she comes from, she uses real-life recordings gathered over long periods of research, restaged as 3D sonic environments, which you're going to hear now, it's all been set up, um, of translated, disembodied voices inside architectural enclosures designed to implicate viewers in a scene. So we're in a scene of the AA here. I'm not sure for them to. <laughs> um, so Dreyfus selected solo exhibitions include Aus der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin, Magasin 3, Stockholm, Extra City, Antwerpen, and Eco Birmingham and Victoria Miro in London and other group shows. Thank you, Smadar. Yeah. עכשיו השאלה היא, מה זה התהפך הגלגל? באיזה מצב אנחנו נמצאים עכשיו? אלי, אני רוצה לשמוע בגלגל, אז אני נותנת לאלי גם, בסדר? אלי? תמיד אנחנו היינו הנרדפים והכל, והיינו המיעוט, היום אנחנו הרוב, ובאים אל המדינה שלנו שאנחנו שולטים בה. יפה מאוד, מדויק. אורי? אנחנו, אולי גם אנחנו עכשיו היינו פעם בגלות ולא קיבלו אותנו, ועכשיו אנחנו לא מקבלים אנשים אחרים. <laughs> what is at stake when using documentary recordings to dislocate and to restage a specific local scene into the, set, into the context of distant exhibition spaces? How does an audiovisual installation embody an act of translation? And can the positioning of a viewer-listener as an active subject in the installation amount to an ethical or political gesture? For me, these questions are intertwined, and I will try to frame briefly how they've persisted over my development of large audiovisual installations. My works emerge from a focus on the role of the voice in the constitution of contested public spaces, how a social and political situation reverberates in the everyday, how sound and voice enact a moment in time, and the way in which culture is embedded in speech not in a forensic sense of looking for evidence, but on the level of affect. Sound has been a developing concern in my work since my hearing started to deteriorate 20 years ago. This has influenced my oral perception as a whole and consequently my work. I'm now using <clears throat> two hearing aids. At the same time, having lived in London for half my life as an Israeli migrant, most of the initial materials for my projects originate in Israel, whose particular contested conditions I've interrogated by re-listening or listening again to the society I come from. I watch my family and my friends back in Israel insulating themselves in order to survive in a polarized society. Not enough people go out to the streets to protest the occupation and the ongoing human rights violations. There is a familiar sense that everyone knows what not to talk about. And I'm interested in the fear and denial that feed and maintain this bubble effect. With the overwhelming increase of violent rhetoric in public life, with the politics of fear seeping from verbal into physical violence and a general sense of instability, this dissonance insists on my attention with urgency. What may produce another mode of perception? How to, bring, uh, how to bring about different understandings? At the core of my installations are spatial documentary sound and voice recordings of actual situations or encounters that I was implicated in. 
These sounds and voices are conditioned, first of all, by the physical and sociopolitical context in which they occur. They are then dis dislocated as spatial sound scenes into spe specifically designed acoustic enclosures. These are dark internal spaces embedded in the host architecture. They are devised to position the viewers and to structure their experience of the soundscape. My installation school, which was premiered in 2011, originated in a melancholic encounter with my old school, which functions as a polling station when I go back to, to vote in Israeli elections. <coughs> Wandering in those corridors, I was reminded of the voices I experienced in my own education and the imprint they left, and of the inescapable fact that this was one of the main spaces of my own formation as a citizen and as a subject. For school, I recorded 68 lessons in eight secular state schools around Tel Aviv in 2009 and 2010, using a spatial arrangement of microphones. Even though schools are public institutions, their spaces are usually closed to most of the public. So I had, work, I had to work under specific limitations in order to get uh, the necessary permissions for, from the educational uh, authorities, sorry. So um, under the conditions of my access to the schools, I was instructed not to interfere with the school's timetables or its daily operations, not to identify the names of the pupils or the teachers or even the schools, not to record any images of the pupils or teachers not to select specific lessons for recordings, and neither me nor the soundmen were allowed to sit in on the lessons as they happen. In fact, I only listened to the lessons properly when I was back in my studio in London. That was the moment I was confronted with the materials as decontextualized channels of sound. My initial grappling to understand the fragments of speech, the partiality of information, was itself a mode of being in translation. And I decided to maintain this sense for the viewers. I wanted to dislocate these scenes into an exhibition space. And of course, dislocation also involves a level of translation. And any kind of translation carries with it a distancing and a loss. For the installation, I selected seven lessons and transposed their disembodied voices, uh, voice fields into a dark labyrinthine space of seven rooms and a corridor. Each lesson is rendered as an immersive sonic environment in its original spatial orientation within its own room inside the installation. The seven rooms play simultaneously in a cycle ending with a recorded school break biology, history, Arabic, Bible studies, geography, citizenship, and literature. And we'll try to play now a very sh few short excerpts and an installation view, if everything works. <laughs> מה תנועת ההשכלה באה ואומרת? שכל אדם... מגיע לו סיגרס חודרות ולחבות והחלטות. צריך לחשוב ולהיות עצמאי. איך אומרים הוא אכל?
everyone. Each room has a blackboard-shaped screen with projected translations of the Hebrew voices synchronized with the rhythm of the speech, each and every utterance. Sometimes they, they are too fast and numerous to fully comprehend, even for native English speakers. To me, this is part of what it means to be in translation. It is never complete, it is always partial, and you have to make do with partial knowledge. I deliberately construct a situation so that the visitor is left to fill the gaps, to actively reconstruct what is being said, and in the process, she gradually becomes more implicated. As a visitor, you have work to do. You are always grappling to understand what's going on, listening and reading, coping with interruptions and distractions, interpreting and contextualizing. You're constantly in translation and translating. When you read the synchronized subtitles, the rhythm in which the words are uttered and the breathing of the speaking voice become the rhythm of the flashing lights. I think this is particularly relevant to a non-Hebrew speaking viewer listener, that she's listening, in the, um, she's listening to the language that is foreign to her, and she can see and feel its rhythm as well as the sounds through her body. I said to create the installation as an affective, translational field. The deep darkness enables one to inhabit the sound as a space. It facilitates an immersion in the virtual space of the soundscape, while the muted physical space almost literally fades away. There is a sense of a dislocation in space as well as in time. Rather than just dislocating the scene, I intended the work to constitute a dislocation of the viewer's space and self-perception as well. The absence of images triggers the viewer listener to come up with her own subjective reading, which may very well constitute a mistranslation. But these misreadings create gaps, where perhaps a different sort of sensibility and understanding can emerge, a surplus, an abundance of meaning um, and a saturation of what goes on in language. She is placed in the middle of the sound scene, in darkness, with only the synchronized projected titles as a light source. She finds herself addressed by the teacher and sitting among pupils who are often distracted, bored and opinionated. Each classroom is a social microcosm. A school is an institution determined by the operations of voice and speech. It's a contested acoustic space in which more than knowledge is transmitted. I wanted this work to be an invitation for everyone to open up reflections on the tension between becoming a subject and being exposed to institutional frameworks, to kind of understand the consequences of education, its afterlives, and how we are able to place ourselves in relation to educational forces. And this is not about Israel per se, but the school system in Tel Aviv serve, but the school system in Tel Aviv serves as a resonating space to understand this formation. Without any representational image to guide you, you may be cast back to memories of your own education in order to complete the picture. And this may then open up a space to question the ideological knowledge bodies underwriting your own education. At the same time, I think the specificity of school, the work, lies in the inescapable fact that we are witnessing a moment in the formation of young Israeli citizens. The conflicts and political reality of the region reverberate throughout the lessons, and we feel the forces of interpolation of the mechanisms by which ideology is reproduced, but also counterforces of disputation and rebellion. There is a tension here between resistance and conformity that seems neither entirely controllable or predictable by the institution. 
After a while, the viewer listener gets used to the darkness. Her eyes adjust, and this produces another sensation of normality, where she can see and navigate inside the installation, creating her own trajectory, busily reading, translating, and conjuring up images from the soundscape in her mind. It is the activation of the viewer listener as a fellow migrant, as a translator, that might constitute the basis for an ethics and the politics of these installations. This ethics is first of all an appeal to think beyond moral binaries, to remain open to complications. But it is also an invitation to meet in a shared space of translation, a disorienting space that encompasses both loss, both loss and the possibility of activating the gaps, not as omissions, but as choreographed spaces for projections, induced memories and participation. And now we have a video excerpt uh, from one of the lessons, which I intended you to experience in complete darkness, but um, let's have it. Okay, <laughs> וכל אחד מביא חוות דעת. והדעות השונות של השופטים בנוגע למקרה של האח דניאל, שהתנצר ועלה לארץ והוא רוצה לקבל בעצם אזרחות מתוקף היותו בן שנולד לאם יהודייה, משפחה וכולי, כן. אז הוא רוצה שיכתבו שהלאום שלו זה יהודי ושהדת שלו הוא מצוין. נכון, נכון. ואז אחרי שקראנו והבנו את השופט חיים כהן, אנחנו נענה על שיעורי הבית שלכם. אז כולם פותחים עכשיו מה שיר? מה? אני יודעת, ואז נתתי לכם, אני יודעת. אנחנו בעמוד 22, אוקיי. עדי, אבל בואי תקני לנו חזק, בסדר? במדינתנו יצרנו לנו מעמד של אומה שבת שלויות במשפחת העמים. ראשון ההכרזה על הקמת מדינת ישראל. והמהפכה הזאת לא הייתה רק בעלת אופן מדיני בלבד. מחייבת היא שינוי הערכים האלה שעליהם התחנכנו בגולה. היא מחייבת רביעית השינוי פרטי של המחשבה הבריאותית בה אורגני מאות שנים. נשתנו הזמנים ונתהפך עד הרגל. אוקיי, יצרי כאן, בואו נראה אם אנחנו מבינים את החלק הזה. הוא אומר לנו דבר כזה, אנחנו חיים עכשיו בארץ, נכון? איפה חיינו פעם? בגולה. זאת אומרת, בכל מיני מקומות שלא חיינו. בגולה, נכון, יפה מאוד. עכשיו אנחנו בארץ, ופעם אנחנו, פעם חיינו בגולה. עכשיו כשאנחנו בארץ, יש לנו מדינה. פעם לא הייתה לי מדינה. נכתוב את זה? לא, עדיין לא. אל תדאגו, ברגע שהכל יהיה מסודר, אני אגיד לכם לכתוב. רגע, הוא לא מגולה או גל? גם וגם. גלות זה... מה זה גולה? גולה זה בעצם... מי יכול להסביר לי מה זה גולה? כמו חוץ לארץ. לא בארץ עכשיו. הגולה זה חוץ לארץ, אוקיי? מי שחי בגולה חי מחוץ לארץ ישראל. להצבעה בבקשה. אז אומר לנו חיים כהן... כשחיינו בגולה, היו לנו ערכים מסוימים. עכשיו, כשכבר יש לנו מדינה, <coughs> כמו שאר העמים <coughs> בעולם, אנחנו צריכים <coughs> לשנות. עכשיו השאלה היא, על איזה ערכים התחנכנו בגולה? מה היה שם? ולמה אנחנו צריכים לשנות את זה פה? לא היה? אני חושבת שהוא התכוון לזה ש... שבגולה לא כל כך קיבלו את היהודים ורדפו אותם ו... ובעצם בארץ אנחנו צריכים לשנות את זה לתת לאנשים תחושה שכן כדאי להם להיות פה ואנחנו כן רוצים אותם ואיך היו, ואיך היו היהודים עצמם? איך הם, כשהם הרגישו ואל תעשו את הרעשים האלה בבקשה בסדר? אני יודעת שזה לא בכוונה, אני מבקשת לא לעשות את זה שירה יפה מאוד, הם כל הזמן הרגישו שהם לא רצויים והיה בהם משהו שהוא מה? 
איך הם היו כ... תחשבו נגיד על יהודים ב... לא יודעת מה, בגרמניה אולי, או במקום אחר באירופה, או בתימן אפילו. האם הקהילה הזאת הייתה קהילה שהיא פתוחה, קהילה שהיא סגורה? קיבלו אנשים ולא... יפה, כמובן שזה תלוי באיזה תקופה מדובר, אבל היו תקופות שבהן הקהילה הייתה קהילה שהיא סגורה. שימו לב, אני חוזרת לטקסט. המהפכה הזאת, זאת אומרת המהפכה של קבלת מדינה, זה שיש לנו, המהפכה הזאת לא הייתה רק בעלת אופי מדיני בלבד. זאת אומרת זה שקיבלנו מדינה, אוקיי, יש לנו מקום פיזי להיות בו, אבל השינוי הוא לא רק שינוי פיזי, הוא לא רק שינוי מדיני, בסדר? מחייב איתי שינוי ערכים מאלה שהתחנכנו, מאלה שעליהם התחנכנו בגולה, זה בדיוק העניין הזה של פתיחות מול סגירות. היא מחייבת רוויזיה, שינוי של המחשבה הגלותית בה הורגלנו מאות בשנים, השתנו הזמנים ונתהפך הגלגל. עכשיו השאלה היא, מה זה התהפך הגלגל? באיזה מצב אנחנו נמצאים עכשיו? אלי, אני רוצה לשמוע אותי אז אני נותנת לאלי גם, בסדר? אלי? תמיד אנחנו היינו הנרדפים והכל, והיינו המיעוט, היום אנחנו הרוב ובאים אל המדינה שלנו שאנחנו שולטים. יפה מאוד, מדויק. אורי? כן. אנחנו, אולי גם אנחנו עכשיו היינו פעם בגלות ולא קיבלו אותנו ועכשיו אנחנו לא מקבלים אנשים אחרים? אולי זה יכול להיות גם במובן כזה? כן, כן, בדיוק, זה המשך של אלי, נכון, בדיוק. כן, יפה מאוד. עוד מעט הוא באמת יגיע לעניין הזה שאתה מדבר עליו, העניין הזה של איך אנחנו צריכים לשנות את המחשבה שלנו ולקבל שבעצם תת אחת, סבלנות, בכוונה, שקט רגע, בן, בן, כבר כמה שנים, שקט, שבועות, בן, אתה רוצה לצאת החוצה לשתות מים ולחזור? אבל תקשיבי, זה לא העניין, הוא אף פעם לא שם יד כשהוא משתהל, זה נורמלי להשתהל, אבל זה לא יד, זה לא נורמלי. אוקיי, אז תגידו את זה בצורה יפה. אבל ככה זה כל יום, כל יום אותו דבר, כל יום. אבל אני פה עומדת ורואה דברים מהצד, ואני יודעת שאם אני הייתי משתעלת וכל הכיתה הייתה מתנפלת עליי, הייתי מרגישה לא נעים. נו ברור, אבל זה גם היה חם היד וכמו אז אם אתם רוצים להגיד לו שישים יד, תגידו את זה בצורה יפה, גם לא צריך להיות מסתרים. לא, אבל אין פה ילדים, אבל זה חשוב. נכון, אני רוצה שקט, שקט. אלכס, לא, לא, ליאור, אני לא פותחת את זה לדיון עכשיו. בת אל, אורי. Thank you for listening and reading. So Shimon Bazar is a writer, thinker and cultural critic. He is co-author of The Age of Earthquakes, A Guide to the Extreme Present with Douglas Copland and Hans Ulrich Obrist. His edited books include uh, Translated By, which was actually um, published by Bedford Press here at the AA. Um, Did Someone Say Participates, Cities from Zero, The World of Madeline Wiesendrop, and Hans Ulrich Sorry, Ans Ul- I've always got a problem with his name. Ans Ulrich Oberist Interviews, Volume 2. He's a commissioner of the Global Art Forum in Dubai, editor at large of Tank Magazine, and contributor, ed- contributing editor at Bidun Magazine. Director of the format program at the AA, which takes place here in the summer. It's clashing with the visiting school in Paris, actually. <laughs> a member of Fondazione Prada's Thought Council and Art Jamil's Curatorial Council. Thanks so much um, to Harlin, to Marina, uh, to all of you for being here. Um, I'm usually the one that does the inviting here at the ASO. It's nice to be invited. Um, I, uh, the, the, so just a little bit of a uh, very, very short pricey before I... Uh, I read through the text that I want to present to you. The word that um, I decided to re- respond to when we were having our preliminary discussions is the word um, translation. Um, oh, could I get a bottle of water, please? Thank you. 
Um, and thanks so much. Uh, and so, and the thing about, um, I guess one of the things about translation is that um, even though sometimes translation from one language to another uh, is impossible, like right, in some, in some uh, fundamental sense, right? So that certain words exist in certain languages that just simply don't exist in another language or certain sentiments exist in one language or culture, and which again can't be fully, um, fully uh, matched uh, in another language and another culture. Um, translation still happens, right? Texts get translated, books still get translated. Um, and, and, and this, again, seems to happen despite the impossibility and despite, the fut in, a, in a sense, the futility of the, of the task itself. Now, uh, there, are, there are two things, uh, uh, listening to our previous presentations um, today, two examples of translation came to mind that um, I've always, I've somehow, uh, felt very warmly about. The first is that of Samuel Beckett, um, the, the writer, the poet, the, the playwright. Uh, as many of you all know, he was Irish uh, by birth. But uh, later on, he, would, he chose to write in French. Um, and and one of the reasons he would do this was precisely because French was not his first language. Uh, I mean, he also spoke Latin, he would speak Italian, but uh, he, he would write in French. And one of the reasons he would write in French was because there was a kind of, because there was a, there was a distance. He had a distance to the French language that he didn't have with the English language, right? So his relationship to English uh, was, that of a nat natural born speaker of the language. So there was a kind of um, automatic uh, intimacy there, whereas with French, it was once removed. And there's something about this being once removed that for Beckett was really uh, very important, also to, I mean, to the, the content of what he was, he was writing about. In addition to this, he would then be, often be the one to, re to retranslate the French into English. I find this also like super interesting, right? So it's not like he would, he would write the story from scratch as, as for, um, in English, but he would translate his own French into English. And so, um, again, it's kind of strange, right? Like there's a, so it's a sort of double othering. And you could say in the process of trying to bring something closer to you, you have to do it by first going further away. I find this sort of very interesting. So that's the first example. The second example, uh, and this came to mind when uh, Lucy was talking, is, is that of uh, Gyatri Spivak. And Spivak, um, of course, was one of the first translators of uh, Derrida uh, and translated uh, De la Grammatologie, uh, which was published initially in French uh, in 1967, of course, so it's the 50th anniversary last year. Um, but, I mean, I won't go into great detail here, but the, the whole story of how Spivak ends up being the one translating De La Grammatology in the late 60s and early 70s is really fascinating, really strange. You know, she's, she was born in Calcutta, 1942. Um, she goes to study in, a, in America. She cannot read or write French. Uh, but someone basically points her to this book by this at that point, not necessarily extremely well-known philosopher called Jacques Derrida, uh, who of course was an Algerian Jew uh, who then entered the French Academy. Um, and so uh, Spivak taught herself French. She taught herself French to translate de la grammatologie from French to English. <laughs> it's kind of extraordinary. And then later she said that um, one of the reasons that Der they be she became very close to Derrida, they became close friends, uh, but she says that Jacques, um, Jacques really appreciated the fact that I was not a native speaker of, of French. In this, because in the same way that he was not necessarily a pure native French 
elite, you could say. That he was this Algerian Jew that, in a sense, often felt out, somewhat outside of, uh, of the academe. Um, he said that, in that sense, Bivak was the perfect person to translate uh, one of his first books into, into English. And so those are two, um, two examples I just want to sort of bring to your attention. Um, so uh, regarding translation, of course, words also translate into images. Um, it's how search engines work, right? So when we go to Google, the, there's the box, we type in, uh, we type in a word, uh, and then it, and a series of images come up, right? So that's how it's very interesting that we, we still need words to find images. It also works the other way around, though, of course. Um, images translate into words. So uh, a, a, a JPEG is um, it's code, it's metadata, uh, it's tags, it's hashtags, right? So the way in which an image is located within uh, within the, you know within the the enormity of uh, of uh, the kind of the glo global system of uh, uh, of data uh, circulation, and I'll talk more about this later, uh, is still uh, is still through writing. Code, of course, code is code is. I mean, there are these interesting moments. It happens less and less as computers get kind of better, in a, you could say. But if you think back to the days when we were all using like Windows 98 or something, there would be these moments where you know an image would stop being an image, and you'd see it as pure code. And you can still do that now. There's a way you can press right click on the mouse, and you could basically see the code version of the of the image. So, so there's, you know, there's a way in which words and images are constantly, in a sense, being translated back and forth, and even more so in, the, in, the, in, the, in our digital contemporary. So this story that I, wa uh, I want to share now uh, is about these things, uh, and it's called uh, LOL, uh, LOL History. Act one. King Jom Nam, the eldest brother of former North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, sorry, of current um, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, was killed in an attack at Malaysia's low cost airport, clear to at around 9 a.m. on February the 13th, 2017. He was scheduled to take a flight to Macau later that morning. Two women, the first being Vietnamese Don Thi Huang, who is 28, 28 years old, and uh, the second, Indonesian Siti Aisa, who is 25 years old, were allegedly asked to wipe baby oil on Jong Nam's face, and they were paid $90 for this reality TV prank. However, 20 minutes after the attack, which was caught on airport security TV, this is one of the stills from there, Jong Nam was dead. The autopsy identified the baby oil as the banned deadly nerve agent, VX. Several North Korean male suspects said to have been watching when the attack was carried out all fled the country on the same day. Did Kim Jong-un consider his half-brother such a threat that he orchestrated this brazen remote assassination on foreign, so on foreign soil an assassination replete with all the hallmarks of a 20th century Cold War operation, unfolding live on 21st century, 24-hour rolling news and social media. On March the 1st, both Huang and Aisei were charged with Jong Nam's murder. Act two, scene one. Soon after the murder, an image was publicly released. This is that image. Clearly, it's culled from airport CCTV. It's low resolution, a casual, a casual pose captured accidentally. And although the release of the image had prosaic purposes, i.e. informing the public of a wanted murder suspect, or indeed crowdsourcing our eyes to try and identify her, the ghostly quality immediately gave the image an unintended life, 
and especially in my own retinal imagination. I became fixated, arrested by this picture of a person whose biography, um, and these are some of the things that were said about um, uh, uh, about Huang uh, as the story was unfolded, that she was a 28-year-old entertainment worker and that she was a contestant on the Vietnamese version of American Idol. And her very last Facebook post, which was posted the night before the murder took place, said, I want to sleep more, but by your side. So what, what mattered, um, all of this mattered less than these three letters, which I'll talk about more in a minute, on her T-shirt, the LOL, um, and also this extraordinary kind of ethereal gait. This picture, I believe, possessed worth. It felt like one of those self-contained images that history delivers to us and reciprocally delivers history. Images that feel both inscribed in the time that they're from and also equally out of time, a ready-made. A thousand things come to mind when I gaze at this image, firstly as a whole, and then increasingly as a constellation of fragments. Act two, scene two. So I was compelled to print it out. I zoomed into specific parts. Her face, her hands, the bag that she's clutching, the dark corona of her eyes, that flat, flat fringe, and I print, printed all these out too. And of course, those three letters on her long sleeve top. I used Photoshop and Max Preview to enlarge the image, each time degrading the resolution. Then I'd photograph the printouts. I'd zoom into these more, and I'd print them out again and again and again. Fidelity somehow felt unimportant compared to a certain kind of oratic essence in this image, something that's locked in the glow of the pixels. Act three, scene three. A man's fetish of zooming into photographs appear in the film Blow Up from 1966, directed by Michelangelo Antonioni, based on a short story by Julio Cortazar. The more the photographer Thomas, seen here, blows up a single frame to locate a murder, the less sure he is that the camera did, in fact, witness a murder. It's as if the camera's claim to truth in that Heisenbergian sense is made all the more uncertain when human faith invests in it. A year later, and Michael Snow's wavelength extended a single zoom shot of a single room to become, to become the entire 43 minutes of his seminal experimental film. It's almost tediously teleological. And though we may end up on the photo pinned here on the back wall, and it's a picture of waves in the sea. We may also have missed a dead body that flashes for merely a brief moment somewhere in between. Michael Snow suggests that our yearning for, for, for forensic truth may be found not at the extremes, but in the incidental middle ground where our attention is least attentive. Act two, scene four. Other post-production tropes that are contained in Duan Ti Huang's digital portrait are, of course, Andy Warhol's reportage, car crashes and his electric chairs, or Robert Rauschenberg's pilfering of newspaper photos into aestheticized pinups, or David Hockney's Polaroid mosaics from the early 1980s, which lends cubism via cheap consumer camera format. Duan Ti Hong's body floats in the darkness of her image, equally glowing and also dissolving, like smeared data. That erratic glow may simply be what happens when very sophisticated technology colludes with its own technical limits. But of course, there's also the glow found in some of Gerhard Richter's best-known paintings of women, the inferred illumination of technology's soul, the substance that Roland Barthes mourned in his elegy to his dead mother, Camera Lucida. Camera Lucida. And the impasto paste around Duan Ti Hong also invoked the charged zones encircling Willem de Kooning's women, 
vortices of matter, history, and horror. Except in Huang's case, the horror is emblazoned in those three letters, L, O, L. This way, her image carries its own punchline, which seems so mordantly, or is it in fact courageously, at odds with cold-hearted killing. Act three, scene five. In 2010, Hamas official Mahmoud al Mahbou was killed in room 230 of the Al Bustan Rot Hotel Rotana in Dubai. A month later, the Dubai police held a prominent press conference. They released a video composed of footage from hundreds of surveillance cameras in Dubai's airports, mal malls, and hotels. It traces the assassination to Israeli Mossad agents and claims that at least 26, su 26 suspects were involved in this highly orchestrated operation. The video was first broadcast on Gulf News TV and then soon uploaded on YouTube. It became a piece of forensic entertainment, almost, albeit one that ends with a real dead body. Very soon after this, Chris Marker detourned this video by adding a haunting string composition written by Henrik Goretsky for the Kronos Quartet. Marker titled the video Stop Over in Dubai, and it was also made avail available on YouTube and also went viral. Now, this seems to be a 20th century espionage caper on a 21st century distribution network facilitated by algorithmic face recognition technology in which Israel is often said to lead the world. Indeed, Facebook acquired Face.com in 2012, and Face.com was an Israeli face recognition group which had been supplying its technology to Facebook for many years beforehand. Act two, scene six. In a BBC documentary about him, the author Don DeLillo spoke about the genesis of one of his novels, Mao Tu, which came out in 1991. DeLillo, DeLillo tells us that it was April 1988, and the cover of New York Post featured an elderly man in shock and in rage. The man was the reclusive writer J.D. Salinger, and this was the first picture of him taken since 1955. So that's 33 years, the first, picture, the only first picture in 33 years of J.D. Salinger. DeLillo kept hold of this picture. Six months later, DeLillo came across a grainy image of a mass wedding conducted by Reverend Sun Myung Moon from the Unification Church, which looked to DeLillo like, quote, a rehearsal for the end of the world. DeLillo saved this picture too. Later, he reveals, quote, I began to understand my novel Mao Tu as an attempt to understand the connection between these two photographs. I think this is such a beautiful premise for a book. So the, this, this startled image of J.D. Salinger uh, and this uh, photo of, uh, of, of a mass, uh, a mass um, Mooney wedding uh, and uh, uh, the novel uh, is the attempt to get from one one photograph to the other. Act three, scene one. If our memories are becoming more like the data sets used by Facebook, etc., for facial, facial recognition, then it's perhaps unsurprising that our eyes and ears have become search engine interfaces. As I continue till today to zoom into the image of Duan, he, Duan Ti Hong, searching for something that beauty both masks and reveals, I remember the seductive gaze diagram by Jacques Lacan. Of course, at one point, um, Lacan says, I am a picture. Um, and of course, that's extremely in key in this, in this diagram here. But today, are we not pictures? Pictures plural, billions of them, packets of electrical pulses pinged between you and me via machines learning to see things we will never see through deep sea cables and actual arteries forever circulationing. So 
Duan Tihong's first, uh, face is certainly not LOL. It's more nonchalant, closer to carefree, a skip in her step, a bounce in her stride as if to say, today is going to be a great day. But once again, it's a face that I've seen elsewhere. The same face on countless different women who Chris Marker would shoot. Among them here, Alexandra Stewart, the narrator of his great film, Sans Soleil from 1982, whereby the gaze coming from the image refused to entirely meet the gaze going into it. There's beauty, of course, but more strongly, something like tender isolation. Can one be as lovely as an image? asked Catherine Belhoja in Chris Marker's 1997 documentary and CD-ROM level five. The thing is, something always exceeds the images of faces. Something always escapes complete capture. And maybe it's why we take so many selfies every, every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shimon. So I'm going to invite Hélène um, to come and give our last reading. She is the Director of Critical Studies in Architecture, well known for its critical feminist approach to the practices and theories of architecture. Her research is further located in the transdisciplinary field between architecture and philosophy, so we've got overlaps there, Lucy. Um, in 2017, she was the recipient of a uh, not going to be <laughs> Rick Spankham's ju Jubileums Fund sabbatical. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One outcome of which is a forthcoming book with Bloomsbury um, called Creative Ecologies. She's also the co-editor of Architecture and Feminisms: Ecologies, Economies, Technologies. Deleuze in the City and Deleuze in Architecture, and the author of How to Make Yourself a Feminist Design Power Tool, which I'm glad to say we already had in the bookshop. <laughs> well, first, I'd very much like to thank Caroline and, and Marina for this kind invitation, and it's wonderful to be here at uh, the AA. Can everyone hear me? Um, I already suspect I'm going to go a little bit over time because I had such a difficult time trying to cut uh, my text down. But we will be concluding with a story today or a series of uh, glimpses of stories. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open with a bit of a methodological background and then I'm going to shift into a storytelling mode. I commence with a methodological promise, what I call transversal writing. This is an approach based on the work of Felix Guattari, philosopher and psychoanalyst, who combined his clinical practical work with his critical thinking, constructing a machinic assemblage of concepts aimed toward mobilizing the tripartite registers of subjective, social and environmental ecologies. Once mobilised in adequate ratio, these can be called creative ecologies. Creative ecologies, TJ Demos has recently argued, call for connectivity and relationality, aimed toward generative rather than destructive ends, recognising at the same time that ecology is not value free. Creative ecologies suggest a counter project requiring a process of decolonizing nature, which Demos hastily adds, also means decolonizing culture. Decolonizing nature's cultures then. For Guattari, it is crucial that concept tools are always mixed with experiences, the milieu from which they emerge. He asserts that, and I quote him, the whole fabric of my inmost existence is made up of the events of contemporary history, at least so far as they have affected me in various ways. If we consider what it is that has composed his milieu, including Les Evenements of May 68, the 50th anniversary of which we acknowledge this year, then we could as well ask, what is it that composes our own milieu? our own local environment worlds? What compels us to voice our concerns today? Is it possible to decolonize imaginaries that cluster in the complex melange of nature's cultures? 
I draw on Guattari's concept of transversality, which, depending on who you read, was either inspired by Jean-Paul Sartre's transcendence of the ego, or else offered as a gift to him by a young woman, a student named Jeanette Michaud visiting La Borde Clinic, a clinic like no other, south of Paris, where Guattari worked between 1953 and where he died suddenly from a heart attack in 1992, aged only 62. With my colleague Katarina Gabrielsson and with the privilege of a Swedish research council, Vetenskaps Rådet, artistic grant, we have been asking ourselves these past four years, what might transversality mobilise when applied to writing? Briefly, and with the help of commentators such as Gary Ganosko, Transversality tracks the emergence of a site of poten pure potentiality. It is marked by such valorised terms as transgress, deviate, defy, cut across, disorganise. All of which suggest speeds and slownesses of movement across a field, an environment world of material relations. Mobility or an ability to, tra to traverse domains, creativity or adventurous productivity, and within limits, the capacity to construct subjectivity, to counter subjection with processes of subjectivation. Transversality is achieved by what Guattari calls a pragmatics of existence, attending to the unicity and irreversibility of a sense of life. Importantly for Guattari, and I quote him, transversality is a dimension that tries to overcome both the impasse of pure verticality and that of mere horizontality. It tends to be achieved where there is a maximum of communication among different levels and above all in different meanings, unquote. The lesson pertinent to the act of writing is to avoid descending into an undifferentiated stream of consciousness or else being overdetermined by platitudes, habitual turns of phrase, and an overly respectable, orderly discourse. Often what is involved is thinking about temporality against the grain, imagining that what came after can modify a point of view on what came before. For us, Katarina and myself, it has become a challenge aimed at habitual academic practices of writing or textual composition in order to propose other approaches, ones more, ade more ad adept at engaging in a contemporary world in flux, undergoing serial crises, through the acknowledgement and respect of a diversity of ecology of practices, to cite Isabelle Stengers, and by attending to more specific material locales or situations. Situation rather than site allows for the flux of duration to take hold amidst re material relations to follow the zigzag line of a transversal cut as a mode of writing as experimenting is to accept that, we, that there are, of course, successes and failures. What I want to do now is give voice to an experiment currently in progress, offer a pinhole camera view of glimpses of seemingly disparate, geopolitically and temporally dispersed voices, things and situations in preparation for a planned novella a project that may or may not come to fruition. What is at stake in what is to follow are processes of decolonization, specifically of spatial memories, including the residual hold of colonial imaginaries and how these might be creatively critiqued. The boy squats fixated by the side of the house in the provinces of the shadows. The rest of the world is asleep, shut eye through the languid afternoon heat. It is only the boy who is awake to the humming quiet. On the front terrace, recently swept by the young help Beatrice, the father's white shirt is open two buttons down and his straw hat with the brown band has slipped the hemisphere of his forehead. A cicada waits. The boy cups his hands and closes them, attempting to draw forth the cicada's singular sound. Separated from the chorus of its brothers and sisters, Suddenly the boy's head snaps to attention during a lull in the rhythm of cicada song. Somewhere near the storeroom, beside the kitchen, off the back half of the house, he has heard a scuffling. In a flash of white crimpled dress and lost ri ribbon, his 
Sister shoots across the path, stirring up dust, before her sandal meets the dirt beneath the orange trees. Then she cuts right, a stripe of red down her leg, and one drop hits the ground. The smell of a cigarette, the expensive kind, the kind rarely to be found in these days of scarcity. The cicada escapes. The boy, distracted, watches it secure its freedom. He cusses in forbidden creole. Lifting off his haunches, the boy trails off and squats down again to place his forefinger into the ground, rubbing the red viscous drop into a paste. A pilgrimage of ants catches its scent and revises its trajectory. The cicada lands in one of the orange trees, standing sentinel to the front facade, as the boy exits toward the left. A bird snatches the escaped cicada in its beak and swallows. Some minutes past four, one of the recently awakened older brothers will down the bird with its partially digested meal from the vantage of the upper floor veranda, catching its wing with his slingshot, a fluke, for his eyes are bad and he has a rather poor aim. Abruptly, the house is awake. Two other bodies, silver quick, shimmy down the heavy columns of the front terrace. This is just moments before the father opens his eyes. The father catches sight of his son's tail ends rounding the house and grunts in surprise. In the darkened salon behind him, his wife leans forward from the cushions of her armchair, making herself visible as though emerging from the camouflage of her afternoon reprieve. The cook in the kitchen, who has mastered the art of napping on her feet, raises her crumpled brown face from her hand, the mark of her large elbow leaving a faint ring of perspiration on the bench top. She goes to fetch the lentils to separate the food from the stones and debris. Settling herself onto a stool in the rear yard in the shade of her favourite tree, a bird with a crippled wing falls plump in her apron lap. It does not cough out its cicada meal, but such a thing would be worthy of imagining. The girl comes along from the south side of the house, a dark look on her brow, but she promptly shifts her concerns, crouching by the cook who takes her hand comfortably in her own. They both croon over the bird, which the girl collects, taking it away to join her secret animal hospital. His ship is due to embark on its long journey south the next afternoon. He has packed boxes of expensive cigarettes as gifts. A going away party has been planned at one of the private clubs in St James, where his friend keeps a room privileged to the kind of membership that has been passed down through the generations. It had taken the utmost charm, the most obsequious yet not quite overt act of seduction to acquire this strategic friendship. The greatest effort had been made to pass as best he could, which had required a daily practice of eradicating any hint of his melodic island accent. Yes, much had changed since his arrival. Emerging, blinking into the light at Temple Station, into a city of gunmetal grey and chalk, a half block from his new campus. The first expletive to hit him was, oi, chink, out of the fucking way. As a delivery man heaved down a stack of newspapers, a grey missile of spittle shot past his feet onto the porous flagstones. Between bears there, syncopated futu creole, bears there, profanities, he had puked his guts up the whole of his four-week journey from the islands to the centre of empire. His otherwise tanned face was jaundiced and slightly swollen, his eyes pinched into slits, the black hair flattened onto his head, greased feathers of a sick raven. His shirt, a new navy suit, hung off his frame. He was a sorry sight. He was not himself. In the weeks, months, and years to follow, he would in any case have to discard himself, layer by layer. Any sign of the distant island self he had arrived with was to be dispensed with unflinchingly. He would reinvent himself, authorise his own existence. His entitlement was to be expressed with ease. He would not only swell into the pleats and folds of his poorly tailored suit, he would soon discover the means to have a new suit fit to measure, a suit for a man of considerably more heft and weight, gone the gangly limbs. Unrecognisable by comparison to the poor, disorientated, foreign-looking sap who had arrived that late summer day, four years ago now, in time for the afternoon edition of the papers. But right now he is in a fix. 
He has suffered a losing streak. He's had to downgrade his ticket home and becomes cagey when his friends ask about seeing him off at the dock tomorrow. No goodbyes, old chaps, he cheerily responds. Come visit my very own island paradise soon. Though he very much hopes that they will not. They have a special treat organised for him. He is led by hand, room after room after room, one engulfed by the next, as though the place were nothing but a luxuriant, velvet-lined interior, shadows and recesses, the lights down low to hide the wear. Tasseled curtains move gently across a doorway. He is led further along. Through these serial ad chambers into a wing of the establishment he had never visited nor realised existed. All those long nights of playing cards and flaunting his winning streak, while scrambling to keep up with his schoolwork. In the end, he had had to sit complimentary exams, but that is all behind him now. Finally, they come to a halt, and he is issued into a chamber. His eyes refocus. She calls to him with her silken limbs and acne-scarred face. He is instructed toward the necessary ablutions. A large washing bowl, a heavy jug, a small deep blue towel. Wash them well in warm soapy water. The water is cool. Now come. He doesn't remember getting his tr trousers down, but he remembers stepping toward her laid out across the bed, paid up and awaiting him. Now her skin looks waxy translucent and her head drops away as her neck curves over the horizon of a pillow. He steps toward her and with the first step he promptly spills himself. With the second and the third step he manages to regain himself. How long does it take? Moves forward more rapidly toward the headless torso. A lamp glows yellow on the far away bedside table. Her left arm stretched toward it as though holding it aloft. He moves toward her now and his early losses run through him red. And so he takes her by the hips and flips her and enters her all in one smooth movement. He takes her via whatever passage presents itself to him and why not take it all? Follow all available openings. He enters into the world and it has a salty taste and the faintest tinge of frangipani. He twists her arm harder. She lets out a whimper and a head attempts to raise itself out of the tussled bedclothes. Then she hesitates and sighs and resigns herself to the violence of youth and the vindictiveness of male virginity. As he exits, she turns and gives him a look which he catches. Back in his trousers now, his damp shirt tucked in. He suddenly witnesses her maturity, her experience. And what he sees before pushing it out of mind and swiftly departing the room is a look that has seen it all before. A look that has measured his kind and found it wanting. The next morning, a growing sense of unease, only matched by his queasy gut, he peels himself off the carpet of his friend's room, grabs his travel trunk and leaves, barely making it down the gangplank in time, hiding the shame of his newly discovered manhood, which comes with an expensive degree, travelling home again, home again. Grey translucent air, as though one could see through a world in which the weight of things is no longer a matter of consequence. She holds her hand up to this new atmosphere, all her veins and arteries etched vividly, and sees through it to the boulevard beyond her window. Cold air condenses on the panes as the streets darken. Her enormous final suitcase lays waiting to be unpacked on the bare floor. The old aunt has retreated to the other end of the apartment and she has been left to her own devices. But she has arrived ill-equipped and is obliged to borrow a cardigan a size too large, a heavy dark knit. The smell of naphthalene as she pulls over her blouse. Cold weeks follow. She finds her routine by increments. Several visits to the local police station finally mean she now has an identity card. The student card had been far easier to secure. But the secretaries in the administration wing remain aloof when assisting her. While inside the lecture halls and the seminar rooms, she feels cold and alone, colder than she has ever been, colder than she could have imagined. They find her a quiet, queer girl. She rarely smiles and she wears rather drab clothes, a maroon ribbon in her hair, a cheap excuse of a fringe. When she speaks, her accent holds a melody that is languorous, and at first they take her for stupid, all at sea in the big metropole, a provincial, no doubt. 
She has a sallow look about her and always seems to shiver slightly despite her oversized cardigan with its large buttons that stare out at the world. Though this first impression proves strong, the girl's voice soon enough finds its way into the lecture hall and asserts itself there. They notice that the questions she asks do not take the winding path of some of their overconfident peers. Instead, her questions, nearly always loaded, strike like small and dangerous daggers. Between lectures on a Monday morning, sitting in the courtyard with a book in her lap, behind her, the tall, unfluted Corinthian columns, beyond which the administration offices are to be found. She has just heard a lecture in art history, an account of Olympia's impudent gaze on the level and offering flowers from behind the bed. She lifts her head, or animal-like, tilts an ear, because the improbable noise of the long lost sea rumbles toward her and then bursts as a wave of bodies spills from the passage on her left, one body nearly falling over the next. And now their laughing voices distinct and now their voices in unison Defense Dante Dia, it is forbidden to forbid, a circular paradoxical construction. It is forbidden to forbid, no prohibitions here. The colonnade across the courtyard is flooded. They move toward her. She recognizes some faces. She stands up warily. They are shouting all together. They near her and a few break away and take her up, folding their arms into hers, raising her up, her book abandoned. She turns in time to see one stray page lift off and take flight, a poster, Usin, Universite, Union, smeared with homemade glue, another poster with a bearded face and a voice through a requisitioned megaphone. Then something begins to burn her eyes. Carry along, she has not been home for a great many nights. She has lost count. In the reclaimed Odeon Theatre, a marathon of speeches, and one crowded afternoon, a young man takes the stage, reserved, neatly dressed, and his serious lullaby voice takes her in. He speaks with the wretched of the earth, that we may claim self-determination, that another world is possible, a world we will call the third world. In the days to come, she will feel the weight of a cobblestone in her hand, her fury rising, a hand barely large enough to hold it, let alone throw it. And her local world will come undone, and a new point of view will be wrenched open. A mechanical ballet springs into animation on Tuesday and Thursday evenings and mid-Saturday mornings as scruffy children circulate up the front stairs of the reassigned shop front through the second story change rooms only to appear again down the back stairs, emerging as neat girls in leotards, faces full pulled back with their hair in buns, ballet ribbons sewn in at the ankles and baked on smiles a near industrial process of the perfection of posture and an institute of corporeal corrections. The mechanical ballet files into the studio at the rear, a former warehouse space behind the shop front, moments after the previous class curtsies and exits, a line of perfectly formed dancers following the reverse process, up the rear stairs, through the change rooms, down the front stairs into the shop front, in order to become normal children again, with scruffed knees, dirty school socks, stained blouses. Classes had resumed after summer. Her family had spent weeks on end under the blazing sun. It is Saturday morning and she has taken her place in the rank and file, about to enter the studio prim perfect, when the new girl in front of her turns around and abruptly asks, are you an Aboriginal? Having never encountered the word before, but feeling a mounting dread on account of the tone of the question, her shoulders fall forward like a struck swan and she mumbles, I, I don't know. Sunday again, and the marvel of yet another weekly cycle, a passage bound through each one of its days, here again Sunday. The wonder of how many such weeks there had been, an attempt to count them up, and how many more there were yet to come, you know, forever. Then the young mind flickers and contracts as it does when confused with a big thought, the colour of deepest indigo threatening to pull you down and further down and swallow you up. The utter and profound boredom of Sunday morning at the local church, a survey of assorted footwear shuffling past the fourth pew on the way to communion. Communion means that the end of mass is approaching. Soon everyone will spill out of the side and back doors and hop into their cars. 
to drive the two blocks home, doors slamming, children crying out, older parishioners frowning or sm smiling. And now it's late Sunday afternoon again, the weekend spent, and a purple lilac tinted evening approaches. She's moving her legs around on the blue tarpaulin, her knees knocking against those of younger and older cousins. Some speak a melodic French cut through with Creole, others murmur in broad English. They don't really pay too much attention to which language they're speaking. The important thing is to have your say, to shove your way into whatever gap in the conversation you can find. Relegated to the aqua blue tarpaulin, crinkling beneath their restless, pale and freckled and tanned and olive and browned limbs. They have discarded the chipped plates, the rice and lentils served and eaten, repulsive though oddly comforting consistency, and sometimes the orange salty desiccated fish, her favourite, in a large aluminium baking tray. Black currant cordial out of old yoghurt containers, sour milk to spoil berry, to eradicate the risk of breakage, household economies. On the kitchen table inside, ever present, a small dish with sliced chilli and white vinegar, and the buffalo grass cuts into their bare calves and thighs when their legs stretch beyond the tarpaulin raft. And later in the evening, the adults beneath the awning ignore their plaintive cries of boredom. The adults talk endlessly in their slow melodies, shattered from time to time with beze, creole, futu, expletives, beze, and tangled with Australiana, where gaps have started to reveal themselves in the mother tongue. Sometimes an older cousin disappears with one of the girls down the side of the house where they linger as the younger ones continue playing. Tonight, as the Super 8 projector begins to whir, the two girls sneak quietly down the unlit hallway and into the bedroom, unoccupied, untouched for years. One door of the bedroom leads into the hallway, which leads further along to the grandparents' bedroom, forever out of bounds. The other door of the aunt's bedroom leads into the lean-to where the other cousins are gathered in front of the Super 8 projector on a tripod. A cartoon, the same cartoon every time, the one where the knives slice through the air in pursuit of a cat who has swallowed an oversized magnet and a mouse who looks on with a belly laugh. The same scenes evince the same laughter every time. The room, the aunt's room, is untouched. No one ever enters. The room awaits them. Their line of escape has so far proved successful. On the low dresser with its squat stool, doll's house like, the eye shadows and lipsticks and hair clips and brooches and mascara and eyeliner are a cornucopia of dress up possibilities. Where should they start? There are the heels behind the built-in cupboard sliding door and something with sequins slips out and something in hot pink and something in orange and another in a shade of turquoise. Their feet are by far too small, but this will not stop them. By now, the vivid emerald greens have mixed with the sky blues and the blushes smeared into the shocking red of small girls who have pulled over their heads oversized garments, who have rifled through forbidden drawers, who have not hesitated to consider the radical contents of the bookshelves. They suppress their laughter, but snort uncontrollably through pink nostrils. Then the door to the hallway opens. Standing there is a woman they have never before encountered, though their bodies murmur in genetic recognition. She looks down at them, a fury of powders and tules and taffetas writhing on the floor of the compact interior bedroom, which she has not set eyes on now for so many years. The next week, news arrives of the eldest son's close call, just shy of a silent bullet that passed him by as the front door to the basement apartment was cordially opened. His old friend's breast, adorned with a plume of unseasonable, unseasonable red, spreading outwards. He turns, a wing and a prayer. He mutters, he ducks out of view. Later, and I stress, I cite from newspaper clippings, Police report that the killing may have been politically motivated. The killer was bearded, they say, and I quote, of African appearance, or of Mediterranean appearance, or of Asian appearance. There appears to be some disagreement after all. Thank you. Yes, there might be, you know, we'll take the first question equally from, from the floor, from this, the, or from the panel. Not panel. Speakers. I wonder what question 
question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I've just said, what was, was there any, anything continuous between these, you know, five different voices, takes, and ideas, right? It's kind of quite breathtaking, the range of, of stuff. extremely um, productive <laughs> and extremely um, fascinating and I, I, I know it's, it's very difficult to identify a question <laughs> um, I don't know perhaps I can um, start by identifying certain um, practices which I uh, in each of these voices um, and I don't know if they will make sense to all of you or um, not, but perhaps it's something to start with. Uh, um, uh, what I, um, it, it's more like devices which um, I thought were very significant in uh, the individual uh, voices. Uh, for instance, starting with Eve, what I would dwell on is the, the comma. Um, and as the threshold or the moment of putting things in contact. And what perhaps makes, creates that uh, condition of sayability. I was very much um, taken by that or in one way in my mind um, that condensed all your, uh, your act, your, uh, uh, what you are saying, uh, speaking being. Uh, and then uh, if I move to Lucy, um, you seem to utilize a lot the idea of metaphor, as you said, as um, either metaphor of strategy or strategic metaphor. And in order again to grasp, or that, at least that's how I translate it, and I think we are in a constant translation here, um, as, the, as the strategy to grasp or the point to grasp, um, the zones at which discourses are being transformed. Hmm? And then uh, moving to uh, Smadar, I would then point out the idea of dislocation hmm, as an act. It's you, you, in one way, you perform dislocation and you staged that process of constant process of dislocation as an act of translation, as you said, on multiple levels. Um, creating through, the, through these multiple dislocations, creating what you said, what you described in terms of an affective translational field, which I found quite powerful. That's how I could understand or experience what you are giving us. And then uh, just I, I point out this very, which it may not be, have been significant for you, Nessa, or the central ones for you, but at least what I'm trying just to, to trace one of the possible threads of continuity. Um, and then um, moving to Shumon, um, again, what I thought was very telling was this idea of this technique of practice of zoom in and what you said as an incidental middle ground, which becomes mar much more. Uh, significant than any of the extremes or the periphery. And actually it's that incidental middle ground which often goes unnoticed. And that's the effect of the um, zoom, zooming in. And also I write, uh, I like the, the ready-made image as forensic entertainment, but I can't, I don't know how to look at that in relation to anything else, but <laughs> nevertheless, I can just say that um, something I, I noted down. And then uh, to Ellen, 
um, I was very um, fascinated by the images, the snapshots you used, and um, I didn't know. Oh, I don't know where these images come from, uh, how they were selected, and in one way, this uh, transversal writing, uh, yeah, which frames these um, images and transforms, transforms the images into stories. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're not just, you're not just telling stories, but you keep on situating viewpoints. That's how I understood the, the, mm -hmm. that process. And in one way, as you said, it's a method of work which can lead to something or not. Well, that's, it's always this uh, um, element of uh, chance there. Mm. So I would, I know it's not a question, it's not uh, an attempt to synthesize everything because that would not be possible and also I don't know if that would be uh, desirable even. But I, I will leave it there and perhaps you or the students or the audience um, um, want to pick on any of these things or on other other themes or other ideas or images or voices. Oh, yeah. I'd like to ask questions about the practice of writing because you've all prepared, you know, the talks. Um, and I think that's one thing perhaps in common. <laughs> But it most, mostly, I think, the, the kind of different types of practices, and it was quite evident when we started. Um, with Eve's presentation, it felt like the, the practice was working through language with the very language and the words themselves. And so the site of your, your kind of experiment or your working is language itself. And then um, Lucia felt that it was more the... Um, well, philosophy, but also perhaps more of an academic voice. And I just wonder if there's a way to reconcile or work through both. And if you've kind of feel um, there are affinities with both. Because I did feel like there was very much a way of just making, plowing your way through language. Um, we were talking about one of the texts uh, by Roland Barthes um, writing on... Um, on Philippe Soler, and he was talking about the le travail, and, and I think in the translation it was it was translated as labor, mm -hmm. and but it is kind of like a, a very strange thing to to, to think about. Cause it doesn't really work, um, but this this idea of um, working with language in different contexts and in different ways, maybe if you could talk about how you work. I just wanted to say, because it was interesting you brought up Michel Serre, because he's been somebody that's been really, really important for my own writing practice, um, because maybe the later Michel Serre, um, was how he would say that um, you can't disregard when you're writing even philosophy that what you're actually really producing is something like literature, right? So there's always a writing practice involved. And also the use of your language. If you want to talk about the experience of working in a coal mine, you've got to go down and understand coal. Right? You can't just talk about, right? And uh, what I, I notice is when we, all of us, talk about something and we feel we've got a very stable object in front of us, yeah? No problems, yeah? And we can pontificate about that object. When we don't have a stable object, we speak very differently, right? We're more anxious. We don't presuppose all of these things, which to me is truly where philosophy starts, is when we don't make that act of presupposition of what we think is in front of us. So. When we write without a stable object, it's very different yeah, from when we do. And I think Michel Serre truly taught me um, actually that, that way of, of thinking and writing. He was really tremendously important to my own writing practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any I mean, what's difficult is that um, the training, the, the, my training made me extremely um, cautious, uh, 
I guess, um, or, or it kind of force, force a kind of caution um, in relation to how you translate, uh, how you re-describe quotations, how you translate the text, how you communicate it and everything. And it might seem conservative or uh, over rigorous. Um, but it's funny because, it's funny, I mean, reflecting again on your interjection earlier um, on, on Schumann, Schumann's uh, uh, question about whether, why, why not, um, I mean, why not speaking about uh, female authors or, or how do I deal with this problem? Um, funnily enough, I had just crossed a section in the very beginning of my talk where, in which I mentioned the fact that the problem that I was raising in relation to the way Serre and Foucault uh, reflect on that problem of madness in the 60s um, actually uh, has a lot of echoes in contemporary debates about the problem of voicing uh, and speaking for, speaking about, especially, and the, the two names I was dropping there where Gayatri Spivak can the subaltern speak, of course, but then uh, I was also thinking, for example, of Sadia Hartman's scenes of subjection. Um, and, but I decided not to, not to introduce these names as to um, clarify um, my line of, of argumentation. So there I really made a decision between um, indexing debates and theories or names and figures and uh, yes and, and, and another kind of work and I think that's very much at stake with with that whole problematic of how to um, bring in different types of voice voices within theory in general uh, what kind of decisions uh, should we make and I know that cultural studies is a completely different world. It is a, a very different world, and it's good that it is, actually. So, yeah, anyways, that's all. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, I want to talk, I guess, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, go back to the question of voice, and, uh, you know, and I suppose my own relationship to the kind of philosophers or writers that you know have been mentioned today, but and, and particularly I suppose a lot of the French ones. But um, you know, one thing that doesn't maybe get talked about enough. I mean, the strange thing is, I mean, Mike, you know, obviously we've been provocative, but there's a sense in which they, you know, these names are so like they're 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 geologies now, right? Like they're. It's as though, and it's as though they've always been there, and they will always be there. And um, but in fact, I think uh, what what the pro one of the problems with that is it bypasses actually, you know, the history of how that came to be, and the fact that you know someone like whether it's Bart or Derrida, um, actually, what it was, you know, they may they may now be uh, held up as like fundamentals in philosophy, but of course they were actually deeply problematized, right, within philosophy, and, and, and particularly in, the, uh, in, the, in our, you know, the analytical Anglo sort of tradition. And one of the reasons was precisely because of how they wrote, right? And precisely attention to, to, you could call it style, you could call it voice, you could call it whatever, but a kind of efflorescence of voice that was considered like the most, like a kind of act of immorality for the kind, you know, for, for, for by that point, uh, the dominant form of, 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 well, a dominant form of tradition, right? So, um, uh, philosophically, to the extent, of course, famously in Cambridge, you know, you don't, you didn't, you don't read Derrida in philosophy, you'd read him anywhere else. Uh, same with Barth, except you'd read him in literature, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and actually, I mean, in a sense, you're, you're reminding me that um, you know, my attraction to so many of these uh, thinkers had, had at least as much to do with how they wrote as it did with what they wrote. Um, and, and in a sense, you know, to quote Beckett again, form is content, content is form. He was talking about Joyce there with the, you know, the early versions of, of Finnegan's Wake. 
Um, but there's this sent that there's a really fantastic essay by Gore Vidal from 1974 called American Plastic uh, in the New York Review of Books where I mean it's this extremely like um, uh, weaponized assault on Barthes kind of um, de you know deification of the nouveau roman and the nouveau roman uh, writers uh, Rob Grier and Durave importantly of course uh, Boutour, etc., etc. Um, but I mean, I agree in, in a sense uh, uh, with Eve here that actually, I mean, for me, the beauty of these writers is that it's simultaneously literature and philosophy, and his and 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 and. and. But at the very least, it's literature and philosophy at once. And so, you know, one can one can, which is why it could be taught in so many different departments. Why it could be taught. Um, I mean, in the recent uh, version of uh, Roland Barthes, by Roland Barthes, the English translation, uh, there's a really fantastic introduction by uh, Adam Phillips it's from 2010. And he, and he already basically says, you know, Barthes, was, Barthes had already seen, had foreseen, uh, you know, uh, the, the age that we're living in now, where everything is I, you know, where the I whether it's the selfie or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the status update, you know, the constant re reportage of my state of being, you know, the, 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 the permanent presentness. Um, and which I find really interesting, you know, there's a, so, and I suppose I just, I want to, I, I want to raise this uh, because we're talking about writing as well. And one, it seems to me one, one has to not shy away uh, and act, but actually deal very directly with the question of form when one is talking about these, these writers, um, uh, these thinkers. Um, because as I say, I think uh, the, 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 heg, the kind of hegemonizing of, the, or the canonization, let's say, of them, somehow um, put, put, sort of puts that aside. And I think that it's important that that also be there at the forefront, particularly when we're talking about the relationship between writing and thinking, let's say, or writing, on, uh, art, thinking, writing and articulation. Yeah. You're making me reflect on too many years of reading French theory. Um, and I, I, I'm always highly resistant to introducing my students to um, Deleuze, unless they come to me first with Deleuze. But then I also reflect on the fact that um, for us who have been reading this material for a while and, and seeing the his, its reception history into, let's say, architecture, for instance, um, and the different ways in which someone like Deleuze or, or Derrida or Foucault are taken up at different junctures to meet with different contemporary problems, if they're being worked with well, um, we, we, we should be careful of being too jaded. I'm not saying that you are. Just because uh, there's always the risk that we... Um, rid uh, younger thinkers of the capacity to engage with a diversity of thinkers. So then the responsibility, it seems to me, is that, oh, well, you want to read Deleuze, but then also read this range of uh, uh, companion thinkers. Uh, let's resituate Deleuze today, for instance. And so how you, help, how you help a student through that reading process, but don't... Uh, this is always, I suppose, the risk with the canon, uh, but uh, certainly Deleuze and Guattari themselves argue that you can kind of um, re-inject your predecessors with the sort of no novel life. Um, and I think that that's really impor important to think about. But I was thinking back through also, um, uh, just in passing, Lucy was talking about the difference between theory and philosophy. It was just in a conversation before. And I'd been, um, I'd been so enjoying listening to Eve uh, performing theory was what came to mind. It was like letting the words do travail, you know, do the work. We can feel that they're working and feeling their way. So language is not coming after the fact. It's working through the problems. And for me, this is philosophy. That the, the language, that the language, like it's you make a mess and you move your way through it, and of course in the end we have to discipline that. That depending on which audience we speak to, for instance. But I was really interested to hear a bit more um, from Lucy. Where would you place that line between theory and philosophy? And you've also placed another line between cultural studies and philosophy. And for me, um, maybe it was the way I grew up and I came to philosophy after architecture, and so I was always going to approach it in a slightly indisciplined way, and I. I also received it when I was receiving literary theory and cultural studies, so the whole stuff got 
mixed around. Philosophers were fiction writers. Um, so I'm just interested to hear a bit more about the disciplination that you're bringing to it. Um, yeah. And yeah, but it, it looks like Eve wanted to make a response too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got a little thing I wanted to say. But... Yes. Give you time to think, yeah? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me there's a difference between when you... When you really try, and I've, I've seen so many books, there's a whole industry of people who are writing on somebody else, you right? And you read them, and all they're doing is regurgitating these people's work. And I rarely read somebody that's taken, they dare to take somebody and actually work it, rework it, augment it. You know what I mean? Put it to use in the way that I was talking about earlier, yeah? Um, and what we forget really is the the pressure of the market play, um, in publishing. It is huge, right? So we do get these endless books and everybody thinks, oh, I can just have that little bit of knowledge of, of a little bit of Foucault, a little bit, you know? And I, I know it now, right? And it's not, that's, I think that's been played a huge role in, in our consumption of theory or philosophy. Um, anyway, that was my little tough as well. I mean, I am very aware that it's true that actually um, um, it is completely geopolitically differentiated. The way uh, the disciplinary boundaries uh, are politically marked, um, what is a canon somewhere is not a canon elsewhere, etc., etc. And and then the market is this other force mm. that that uh, uh, that work through each of these points in its own way. So it's extremely complicated to in this sense to, to say, okay, there's a really clear boundary uh, between the field of philosophy and this kind of outside, also because the field of philosophy is extremely hard to define anyway, so... Um, but I, I guess there would be a, a, a way of... Uh, when, when you are within this discipli disciplining space, then you realize that you I mean, with publications, precisely, with all the things in which you need to follow rules, then um, you realize there are very clear boundaries. And, you know, uh, publishing on Michel Serre is impossible in a philosophy journal, almost. Yeah. Uh, things like that. And, and so when you stumble over these obstacles, then you feel, okay, then there is something policing me about um, my discipline. And, okay. But, but, but then there's a historical, I mean, a historical narrative of the the dissolution or the move of philosophy into theory is really interesting and it has two br branches traditionally or the way I've, uh, I understood it. One is in, in German critical theory, early 20th century, and the second is in la a slightly later French theory mm. with uh, Althusser's uh, uh, reworking on the, the concept of theory and then um, the explosion of French theory uh, which has become uh, so many other things. And, and, and in a way, my talk, it wasn't so clear, I guess. Uh, I didn't sp uh, spill out, every I mean, I didn't uh, spell out everything. However, uh, in, um, uh, sorry, I've lost my thread. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, um, um, no, yes, um, actually my paper. Um, uh, one of the aim was precisely, one of the things that I'm really interested in is precisely to understand um, um, uh, what shall we do with all these uh, uh, use of uh, Foucault's concept of discourse, work around discourse, discursivity and all that, which has been taken up so much across so many disciplines, and, um, and how do we uh, rethink that uh, from a more philosophical standpoint? So how uh, do these encounter then can nourish again uh, philosophical thought? So that's one of the lines that I'm quite interested in. And, um, and again, um, why maybe the 60s is interesting in relation to what we talk about is precisely because there intersects the whole problematic of style and the question of a philosophy of language. And so many different stratas of language were evoked, actually. Uh, uh, some which were much more about 
interlocution and about par what they socio would say parole and the other um, uh, and, and, and then other levels you mentioned in the beginning uh, much more ontological or metaphysical um, uh, aspects of language so the linguisticality in the world that's what Benjamin talks about uh, and then I talked about the question of the system uh, 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 and um, so interesting to see as well Elena Sissou actually yeah. It was the time really, yeah. the French theory to no, no, expand the field. It's, it's, uh, when Ellen Sisu actually did her, her thesis, maybe uh, you, you, you haven't read it, but on the language of the demented. So there's this, yeah, this obsession with working with the language. But I, I have another question as well, because we're talking about the canons and you know their importance and everything. I was just thinking about the status of the um, the writer who writes about and whether or not there is a place for that indeed and it, it shouldn't just be seen as something that's um, secondary or kind of of lesser quality somehow but as something quite genuinely new and novel and actually um, in its own right. Um, yeah. I think it's a real art about writing about something right? I mean, uh, there's, there's different ways, I think it, it's nuanced, right? And like what I said before, I think it's when you write about something and you you kind of take it for granted what it is that you're writing about, yeah? Um, when you're not, when you're writing, I hate to say it, but you're kind of writing with it. I mean, I know that's all been done before, right? But um, it, it, somebody can, it's really an art because they write about something and you go, oh my God, I didn't think of it like that before. I've just been made to see something completely different. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's amazing to be able to do that. Mm. And I think it's, yeah. you know, it's very easy to fall into that distinction between, and I, I said it earlier, you know, all the stuff that writes about something. Because mm. um, we're all doing a little bit of it all, I think, when we write, yeah? Uh, just to follow on that, because we never really write about something and that something is always external to add what we write. And we always relate to it as, again, something different, something distinct. I think what we write about informs the way we write, and what the, when we start writing, then starts informing and transforming the object we write about. So I think that distinction that we may have an object to write about or just write, it's not as clear as we want to say, I mean, always, and, and I think that goes back to the question of form, mm -hmm. and what you are doing is transversal um, cut, because apparently there are certain objects, but these objects, they keep on being transformed through that process of writing. Mm -hmm. So nothing really remains, it's not that we have an object and we write about the object. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's what we all witnessed that um, afternoon, that the process of writing produces the object to a great extent. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps that's how we can also start um, relating or putting together writing, comma, architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you would like to say something, Helen, on that or Smada. And perhaps then to turn us to the um, students who I see they are ready to <laughs> ask the questions. Well, just, just very, very briefly, I'm thinking of writing because I'm editing, I'm not a writer. And I'm just kind of a thought that came up to me now that I'm actually writing with voices that I listen to. Okay, it's a, it's a process of collecting and listening and listening and then editing is a form of writing. And, you know, and the, these are voices, this is not my voice, but my voice is there. So this is a kind of an interesting position I find myself with the banks of recordings that I have. You know, how, um, how do I extract something and make it super precise? As, um, because basically what I do, I kind of lift the structures of speaking, structures from the real, you know? It's a kind of a speaking, the, um, taking kind of fabrics of speech uh, that exist at a certain point and uh, transferring them to another um, 
space, context, culture, everything, without the image. And then they become maybe a form of writing by putting them as groups together. Well, in the case of the school, I mean, school, each lesson has a content. It's not just how they speak, it's actually what they are talking about. That you're eventually, this is why I gave the, the extract, because I wanted you to experience just a little bit a kind of the experience of these lessons. And um, while I, I did edit the lessons, from 50 minutes to 26 each, because of the installation and necessities. And um, I still try to keep the, the textures, the fabric, the, the topics of the conversation in a way that I don't interfere. I don't make anyone say something they didn't mean or something like that I mean, within the... So there was a way of finding a way of, of keeping a, um, the narrative going and keeping you there as an as a viewer, as a student, as a learner, and suddenly, you know, you're embedded in that. Yeah, we the, the viewer becomes part of the narrative. The other thing that goes on there, and I mentioned to Lucy in the, in the break, <clears throat> that what's actually happening there is that um, I never saw who spoke where. I was never allowed even to put a small camera there, right? So I just got these sound spaces. And, and channels of sound. Uh, so every little utterance becomes ma uh, got mapped on the screen, in a sense. So the small bits of uh, articulations which are not related to the lesson also become part of the lesson. So there's a lot of different translations and interpretations that, are, that have become flattened on that screen. You know, the teacher that translates the uh, prescribed text from uh, the book, the <laughs> students that start relating to what's happening to the context or to each other, or everything. but everything as a social fabric, as a social microcosm becomes kind of another text. Anyway, yeah, that's what I was trying to and speak about my writing. And there, uh, there's the process of translation which you haven't talked about. But there's the process of translation as well, because you translate it. I, uh, I mean, the, but the, the translation is on many, many, many levels, you know, on the architectural level, on the, it's just on many levels. It's not just the lingual, and of course it's, I am the translator of my works, I don't give it to translators. So it's, it's kind of a, and it's a kind of a process, and I think the process of translating and re-listening again and again and translating and thinking is another way of experiencing that um, social space, social fabric, uh, uh, ideology, all the things that are embedded in each and every lesson. So that comes into, yeah, the writing. Can I just ask you a question? So I just had a question for Hélène Frichot. Um, I just wanted you to um, reflect on the fact that you use uh, narratives and the relationship between uh, feminist theory and uh, the writing in narratives in so far as I feel that it's been something that's been practiced quite a lot over the past 10 years or I mean that has grown or around me at least and I was wondering in your own because especially in relation maybe to the problem of subjectivity and, and witnessing because you know what you did was not uh, was precisely uh, the, 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 the space of the subject was kind of um, moving and hollowed out uh, not at all um, an enunciation in the you know in the eye uh, so I was just wondering how you situate yourself. Uh. <laughs> There's a bunch of tensions going on here, actually. Um, and uh, and uh, coming from uh, a long history of reading Deleuze and Guattari to 
sets up various roadblocks for me because they have this prohibition against narration, illustration and representation. Um, uh, but of course, one has to be careful about how you read a prohibition, I suspect, and what exactly they might have meant. And so in some ways, in some ways, on one level, I'm working with relatively kind of straightforward narrative. I'm kind of telling a story, um, a bit like you might tell a family story or something. But at the same time, I'm trying to sort of like, uh, I was thinking about it earlier today, actually, a bit like taking an image and running it through the photocopier a number of times to get it to lose some of its definition or to shake out some of its... Uh, refrains or habits or turns of phrase and I don't know whether I've been necessarily successful with that and um, these fragments have been growing over quite a long time um, uh, I don't know whether I don't know whether um, what they're not doing is expanding the limits of language. So they're not doing an Eve kind of experiment, which I love to do too. Like I love that mode of like you are getting the concepts to work against themselves, to m motorize them or something. So in some ways this has got more convention to it. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, um, but I am wanting to sort of m exactly mobilise those points of view and shift that around. And in, in fact, in the structuration of the parts, they're all meant to be uh, kind of colour coded as well. So that in some ways, these are very sort of basic conceits of, of formalising it and structuralising it. Um, but this is some of what's in the background of the construction of the narratives. And um, in terms of uh, where I guess it might hit the ground in terms of a sort of um, feminist take is in this sort of uh, possibility of the construction of subjectivity through time. So there's meant to be this one moment where a young woman discovers something about herself as well as encountering another way of reading her background. Like, she gets politicised. So I've been thinking a lot about when you come from a very sheltered background, what, what hits you in the face when you get politicised? Something, you suddenly realise that something abhorrent about the way you've been brought up. And how do you make that realisation and how it must radically break you apart so that you can reconstitute yourself? So that, that's one of the kind of behind, uh, one of the thoughts behind it that I think, uh, which is much the same when you have anything like a feminist awakening, where you suddenly realise things were sort of untenable before and I just hadn't seen it. And something hits you in the face and uh, the world looks slightly different, I suppose. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, so thanks for your readings. Um, my question is sort of more for Schumann. Um, so at the beginning, Marina said that a, a, um, a voice is a sound with meaning. And I was just thinking a lot of the texts that you're speaking about are silent, um, like in the digital world, like the code, um, texting, email, all the forms of communication are often read with an internal monologue, which also goes on to link with what you recently said about this I, the I-ness of now. So I was wondering, um, how does the sound of voice come in, in terms of this internal monologue, or how we hear the data? Uh, well, maybe, um, when, just to go back to a little bit, when Marina was saying, um, or just sort of describing that the relationship between writing, um, let's say, you know, you as a subject and an object is actually, it's a kind of quantum relationship, right? So, uh, you know, and you know, we go back to cubism as, you know, one of the sort of founding moments of this that, but there's some, I think the important thing is it's, di it, it's, not, it's not that it's even dialogical. It, I think it's truly quantum, okay. right? Like, so, um, and there's a, there's a quote by um, Ohan Pamuk, the Turkish uh, writer, novelist, once said that cities, he said, cities don't become great until great books are written about them. You know, and I would add, until great films are made about them. You know, and so there's there's this way in which something I think actually. I mean, it's not that it has to be. It's not even a question of it being named. Of course, naming is like the, 
is, is really fundamental. But beyond that, I think it has, to, you know, things don't become what they are until they're, they're written about, actually until they enter into some form of like mediatized imagination, you know? And it, it's not even a question of, I mean, yes, it's, it's about whether we understand it or not, right? But I, would, it, I think it's more ontological then. Like, it, they don't become until they enter into that field, you know? And so, I mean, I, I, every day I, uh, I kind of, kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, kind of, uh, uh, anguish is the right word, about, you know, why bother keeping writing? Uh, particularly at this moment in time when, as I say, there's, I mean, we're, it's not that there's overproduction of just words, there's overproduction of everything, right? Like um, information, data, content, every, you know, and um, everyone can now access, everyone can write, everyone can have an opinion, and those opinions, whether they're informed, disinformed, um, suddenly will take on the status of, uh, you know, uh, a truth, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then to go back to Eve's thing about the market, you know, like, Frankly speaking, you know, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to, if you want to uh, have a comfortable middle class life, you know, where you can pay a mortgage and buy a car and things like that, don't become a full time writer, right? Like, it's, uh, there's almost, it's, I mean, you know, agents will tell you it's becoming more and more impossible to, to only write, you know, in the same way with, with you know, trying to become a, only a musician today, like these, we're in a weird sense the total dissemination the total democratization of content also means the decimation of the economy of that as a as a practicing person doing that but you know so i i can't i sort of veer between these you know like having faith because and, and i think a lot of that faith is is just there because it's partly geological like it's what we grew up with, you know? Like, and so that's, that's nostalgic and it's sentimental. And that, I'm not dismissing that because that's who we are. But then it's like confronting that with the realities of the status of writing, or, 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 you know, today. Um, but I do go back, I would say that we, you know, it, it, has, to, it has to happen because things, things don't come into being until they're written about. I, th I really believe that, you know. And it sorry, doesn't that define ontology? By being said. <laughs> no, but I, I do think it's no. For me, it is. It's 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 a it's a quant, it's a quantum relationship, right? Like it's it's the fact that I mean the thing whatever the subject is unstable, you know. Like it it's there. It's not there. It exists. It doesn't exist. It have has voice. It doesn't have voice. It, and same with, with writing itself, like it's, it's deeply unstable, you know, and, I, and I th for me that my favorite writers are the ones that I can see there, the, 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 there's an acknowledgement of the instability of what it is they're trying to say, which is why I, for me, you know, discover, discovering Bart, discovering Robrier, actually a lot of the French, like when I was like a teenager or in my early 20s was so important, mm. precisely because of the kind of opacity to, to access meaning through the writing. And the opacity, like the fact that it didn't yield immediately, right? So it's not like, and then there was a chair and there was a table and they were having a croissant, you know, which could be a line from a Grob Grier novel, right? Like, but he would put it in a, in a way that you'd be like, really? You know, like, what, what, is the shadow coming from here or not? And, and so I actually think, uh, and for me, the, the, so it's the practice of philosophy that engages with a form of writing that is, uh, is actually, perhaps in a, in a strange way, against you know, what we consider as in, uh, in Greek would be aletheia, right? Like un the unconcealedness of being, right? Like revelation. But actually is attending to the fact that there's, there's never a total revelation, right? There's never, it's like, it, if it happens, it happens in like weird fragments, it happens in weird bursts. It's mostly opaque. And an acknowledgement of that opacity, right? And, and, of, and as I say, of this quantum relationship, for me is, is where I've, I've, I've found most kind of sympathy in terms of the thinkers that, you know, that I've engaged with. I hope that helps. Uh, 
Um, this was uh, something that maybe you might comment on, Eve, and I was just wondering on, and you were just saying about being and said, and then the idea of the comma, and if the comma always has to be said. Oh, God, this time of night. <laughs> It's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, mm, I'm not an expert, but different treaties on punctuation, yeah? And the, the history of the comma is quite interesting. It was actually a slash, right? It was an Italian um, prim, uh, uh, publisher that actually dragged it down and gave it a little squiggle like that, right? It was just literally a slash to break up. Um, and I think with punctuation, where you don't hear it, and it's very interesting about the spoken word, um, I've been reading um, Alfreda Jelinek. I say her name badly, right? And I really recommend everybody try and read her charges, yeah? Because punctuation is doing the most amazing thing there, and particularly in giving voice or voicing. And she knows it's really precarious in terms of the refugees um, that particularly turned up in Vienna at some point. Um, so punctuation is doing something incredibly musical there. Yeah, so you actually do hear it, right? But today, how could I make that comma be, I could only say it, because it's a red experience, which I thought was quite interesting, right, given the remit of today. But so I, had, I wanted to say comma. I could have just lived in that little sort of, uh, you know, and let you think there was a comma there, yeah? I don't know if that's an adequate answer. <laughs> can, I, can I tell yeah. you my favorite comma in literature? Yeah, go on <laughs> It's in, uh, it's in Nabokov, it's in, it's in Pale Fire, I think. Mm -hmm. And da 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 da, uh, open parenthesis, picnic, comma, lightning, yeah. closed parenthesis. And it's just like, whoa. You know, I mean, A, picnic, lightning is already brilliant within the brackets, but that comma there is just killer. It's just yeah. like really, really killer, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a question more for Hélène. And uh, I was just wondering if you could expand, you mentioned when you were talking first about your methodology, and you mentioned an emphatic distinction between using the word situation instead of sight, and I w wanted you to expand more on why do you use situation and what's the relation to sight? And, yeah. Um, a really basic response would be, I think a situation offers temporality to a site. Um, in, our, in architecture, uh, a, a, a good friend and a very well-known sort of um, uh, scholar working in, uh, in the domain of architecture writing would be Jane Rendell. And so you might have seen her site writing, um, you know, which I think has been... Uh, which is a really beautiful book and also a great inspiration for students and so forth. But I've been thinking a lot about um, how the site, when you turn it into a situation, you allow it to have this kind of temporality and also various collapsed temporalities mobilised together. Um, and it's also emerged out of a conversation with someone that I've collaborated with. Um, but that's... Uh, and I'm still working on it myself, in all honesty. But, um, yeah, that, that would be the simple answer. Is there another question from... Yeah. Hello, my question is to Eve. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, thank you for a wonderful spoken performance, yes. as part of which one of the statements that you made was, call me a singularity. Mm -hmm. I found that statement quite fascinating because it is kind of an obvious statement but it has a sense of power, a sense of effectiveness in the way it is composed as a written statement. If you could expand on that and the yeah. effectiveness of writing Ooh, through effect. that statement, call me a singularity. Actually, funny enough, I, I slipped that one in this morning and I very rarely do things like that because I've been stuffing myself full on a um, particular set of... Uh, uh, anarchist I really enjoy reading called The Invisible Committee. Um, and uh, anyway, um, for me, a singularity will always take me right back to, and it was Deleuze that actually um, made me understand it in terms of Spinoza, 
right? So singularity has nothing to do with I, it's not a me, me, or anything like that. It's simply to do with a kind of, um, my coming into being is not answerable to any causes external to me, right? So there's nothing separated. So there's like a logic of exclusion happening there, right? Um, so, and, 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 and a, a singularity is not an opposition to a multiplicity, right, at all. It's, it's just that it is that now moment of existence, which probably is more an event than a notion of a substance, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. And to be that singularity in language to me is incredibly powerful. To just be there and know at that moment, I am actually nothing more than that. You know, I might think I'm somebody, you know, but I'm not. I'm just that person there speaking, nothing more. So in a sense, you are really quite, I think, really exposed. And you are a singularity at that moment. Is that a good enough answer? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Going now, just one very little addition saying about singularity. It reminds me of the title of the book by Jolie Nancy, being a singular plural mm, with yeah. no commas there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> being singular plural. <laughs> yeah. uh, any other question? Um, Hi, um, I would like to comment on Smadar's work. Uh, I find it very interesting, of course. Um, I think that the experimentation you have with sound, of bringing sound uh, to build uh, or to bring us uh, some kind of context with the school, uh, was very uh, interesting. Um, it reminds me, it makes me think also about these old radio shows that, where they used to uh, tell stories with sound effects just to bring the whole story together. And, um, and I think, uh, and I was thinking that uh, putting these microphones in the schools and having these, these sounds that you have to translate into text, how would you compare that with an interview? When you wanna, when on in another case you you're, you're trying to build a text, but with an interview and not not with the with the with the mode you you took. And lastly, uh, I disagree uh, when you say uh, that um, there is no images on your work, mm -hmm. because I think the way you put the words, uh, well, the translation in the presentation, the size of the words, and the location of every single, and the rhythm of the appearance of the worlds, for me, is already an image. Thank you for this really good comment. I mean, first of all, I, I said there were no representational images, but this is my problem of writing or thinking, how do I say that? Because obviously, the subtitles are an image, they are the only image that you have to uh, constantly be uh, negotiating, engaging with, in order to to build something else completely. I think, yeah. Um, something about the, the <clears throat> something I didn't say, I guess, or I didn't say the word documentary, because I think there is a relationship to the documentary, um, to the fly on the wall or whatever it was. You know, this kind of condition of not. Uh, recording something and not even hearing it while I'm recording it and not even knowing where it is and why, you know, and then just kind of figuring it out from the sound itself. Um, I think, I think it's different to editing an interview, probably. I mean, I know that each lesson, yes, has a structure. Of course, there's a text there, there's a content, very particular content. Um, but there's a lot of other things that happen there that, uh, for me, they are major, like the coughing, you know, and the teacher trying to uh, do something very, you know, be civil, teach civility in some way in this kind of lesson that speaks about, uh, you know, grave things, really. Um, so it's all this, how these things inter intertwine. I can't edit it like an interview so, uh, like I, I can't try and micromanage it. You know, it's really about br bringing this reality. The, you know, what I did that was significant, I think, was the selection of these seven lessons from 68 that I managed to record because I really didn't see what I was recording. I didn't know what I was recording. I didn't have any control of which lesson, how the lesson, you know, what 
how the lesson would be run or anything. It was just like putting the microphones on the ceiling in the morning and going to press record or stop during the school break. And then looking at the, uh, listening to the material according to the spatial formation and mapping it. So for me, it's, I can't even compare it to an interview. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Any other? Perhaps I think we can pause here. And I say pause because there, there are drinks and there's some food, so and you are all invited, so we can continue our discussions in a more relaxed way. <laughs> but I, I would like to thank all of our speakers for a fascinating, really fascinating uh, day, um, and to thank the students for being with us, and for being with us not only physically, but mentally. And as I said, we can continue our discussion and again to say that we would like to think of that as the start of a number of other encounters and exchanges and not as something one-off um, event. Thank you very much and please join us.